Okay, now we're streaming live. You may start us off, Izzy. Good morning. I mean, good afternoon, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Governmental Operations. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We're ready to begin. So this meeting comes to order. Let me gavel it in. Good afternoon. I am council member Fernando Cabrera, chair of the committee on the on governmental operation. I want to start off by thanking the co-chairs of the council census task force. Council members, Carlos Menchaca and Carlina Rivera for the leadership of making sure that every New Yorker gets counted. Thank you so much. You did a marvelous, marvelous job. And a special thank you to the dedicated advocates with us today who have worked so hard for over a year now to make sure New York gets a complete count, especially under the circumstances you were working with. I want to acknowledge that we had been uh, joined by council members Menchaca, Rivera, Kalos, myself, and Perkins. Yesterday's Supreme Court decision was extremely disappointing. Disappointing. Until yesterday, we had until October 31st to get a complete count for New York City. Now, thanks to the Trump administration that is determined to rush the census count at all costs, the count will end on Friday at 6 a.m. That means New Yorkers still have over 24 hours to respond. This is a setback. Let me say that again. This is a setback, but the fight isn't over yet. We have made remarkable progress in raising our count uh, this summer and fall, despite having it in person outreach plans turn out upside down by the global pandemic. As of now, our response rate is a little over 61%, which is only a little over five points behind the national rate. In 2010, there was a 14 point gap between the city and the national rate. So we should acknowledge that remarkable success in closing the gap. But a 60, let me be clear, but a 61% response rate is still too low. We can do better and we have some time. I'm calling everyone who's watching right now, go on social media right now. I want you to alert people. Most people do not know. We only have into Friday at 6, for a Friday at 6 a.m. Uh, so let's do this last, let's make uh, a wave, uh, uh, a bus. Let's create some bus. To, to get more people uh, to uh, fill uh, their census. It is true the circumstances today are different and more challenging than a decade ago. Right as the online census form went live in March, our city became the epicenter of an ongoing global pandemic. And we remain in a state of crisis as we are witnessing signs of a second wave. We saw COVID-19 ravage parts of our community that, community that were largely vulnerable and lower resources. 
This is the backdrop of today's call to action. We need a complete count of every single New Yorker because we need to make sure that our city receives the resources it needs to address the current crisis and future ones over the next 10 years. The census data are used to calculate federal and state funding allocations, not only for health care, but for also schools, SNAP, housing, roads, and other critical safety nets, net programs and infrastructure. The first thing we must do in our fight for federal resources is to complete census count, a, a, a complete census count. I also like to call attention to the upcoming presidential election because the census is critical here too. First, I want to make sure everyone listening has a plan to vote. The census count determines how many seats New York gets in Congress and it impacts state and local redistricting as well. New York City could lose up to two congressional seats if we are undercounted in the 2020 census. I'm sure my colleagues have even more to add. So before I hand it over to them, I want to thank the staff that have made it possible, this hearing possible. My committee staff, committee counsel, CJ Murray, senior policy analyst, Emily Forjone and Elizabeth Cronk, senior finance analyst, Sebastian Bacci, and community liaison, John Blasco, my legislative and communications director, Claire McLevain, and the rest of the census staff, task force staff, including finance analyst Luke Sergili, unit uh, head Chima Obituary, and Anthony Perez, deputy chief of staff to the speaker. Thank you to our, our, our data team, senior data analyst Rose Martinez, and data scientist Rachel Alex, Alexandrov. Uh, big thanks to you as well to the team of staff across the legislative division who are working behind the scenes to make this hearing run smoothly. I will now turn it over to the 2020 Census Task Force co-chair, Council Member Carlina Rivera for a statement. Thank you so, so much, uh, Chair Cabrera. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, co-chair of the New York City Council's Census Task Force. I wanna thank Chair Cabrera for holding today's important hearing. It's been said before, but it bears repeating. Getting a complete count in the 2020 census is absolutely critical to our city's future, especially with what we expect to be a long recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. The Supreme Court just allowed the Trump administration to shorten the count yet again. This blatant effort to exclude immigrants from the census count could lead to an accurate, an inaccurate count that could negatively affect New Yorkers for a decade. The count ends on Friday at 6 a.m. It is urgent that we count as many New Yorkers as possible in the little time we have left. As we all know, the city is in the midst of a severe budget crisis, so I wanna get some facts straight about the importance of the census to our city. In fiscal year 2017, an estimated $121 billion in federal funds flow to New York State based on decennial census-derived data. Our finance division estimated that pre-pandemic, 9% of our city budget or $8 billion came from federal funding. I know many of my constituents rely on the programs that these funds support, such as Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, Section 8 housing vouchers, education grants, and more. Not to mention that we all benefit from federal investments in infrastructure like our roads. Last year, we secured $40 million for census work in the city's budget in collaboration with the mayor's office and CUNY because we knew it was a necessary investment in the future of our city. Today, we're checking in on that investment. The last six months have threatened to derail our momentum, but we have not given up. We have many, many partners and stakeholders who share our vision of a complete count. We have a little over 24 hours to count as many New Yorkers as possible. The stakes couldn't be higher. We look forward to hearing on the incredible ways in which grassroots efforts by local leaders, community-based organizations, the mayor's office, the borough presidents, libraries, unions, faith leaders, the business community, and others 
have stepped up to bolster the work of our partners at the US Census Bureau in the midst of a truly unprecedented global health crisis. Thank you to my chair, Council Member Menchaca, for his fierce commitment to this initiative. I'm proud to have worked with you on this once in a decade opportunity to ensure that our city gets the resources that it deserves. Thank you also to Speaker Johnson for putting the Council's 2020 Census Task Force together, to the Governmental Operations Committee staff for planning this hearing, to the Task Force staff for their consistent efforts to ensure a complete count for New York City this past year, and of course to my whole entire team for their support. Not only did we make sure that we were accurate in our messaging and reaching people and collaborating with credible messengers and community-based organizations that have done this work for a very, very long time, but we were out in the streets very responsibly making sure that we were reaching people to let them know how important this effort is. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. And I will now turn it over to the 2020 Census Task Force co-chair, Council Member Carlos Menchaca for a statement. Thank you, Chair Governor. And uh, buenas tardes, everyone. I'm Carlos Menchaca. I'm co-chair of the New York City uh, Council's Committee on um, the Task Force for the Census. And I just want to say thank you to all the incredible staff at the council, whether you work for one of the chairs or co-chairs uh, or at central staff. I, I just felt like every, every left and right turn we, we made, we were supported by you in these moments of getting data and information out into our, into our communities. Uh, none of this could have happened without, without you. And there's so much that's happening with the, uh, the administration. And so I want to thank the, the team on the ground. And we saw you, uh, whether you were holding uh, a pamphlet uh, or, or a microphone uh, or dancing on a truck, uh, we saw you. And, and I think there's a lot to celebrate as we get here. But we're going to be asking some questions about how and what happened and what we can do in the next few hours uh, to ensure that we can get a, a best count. Um, this work couldn't have happened either if the city council didn't commit the incredible funding. And so I want to thank Speaker Johnson and Finance Chair Drum and the BNT uh, for never, ever saying no to this from the very beginning. And I know it was a big surprise to bring that funding. Uh, so we want to look at what that funding did. Uh, today we are witnessing the devastation that chronic under-resourcing and systematic racism can wreak on our communities. It's no surprise that black and brown communities, including immigrants, have been hardest hit by the COVID pandemic. They have had to fight for recognition of their inherent worth in society for far too long. When a crisis like this happens, we face, uh, we face this disadvantage. Uh, worse health, health outcomes happen. We, uh, we get to, to compare what happens in immigrant communities, black and brown communities with white communities. Those are all things that we're talking about. And this summer we have seen yet again that the Trump administration tried to deny immigrants and cities where they live, the basic resource and representation they're entitled to. By trying to exclude undocumented immigrants from population counts used for apportionment, the president is saying immigrants don't matter. By trying to shorten the census response timeline and rush the count, the president is trying to sabotage an accurate count for political gain. This is how this administration works, a white supremacy driven institution. We must fight back by making sure that every last New Yorker is counted, even if we just have hours. The census is a great equalizing force and you're counted no matter your age, county of origin, a country of origin, race, ethnicity, the language you speak, your sexual orientation or any other identity. And when you complete the census form, you're saying I'm here and I count. New York City, as, a diverse, as diverse as it is, is made up of many historically undercounted populations, such as African-Americans, renters, limited English proficient individuals, and immigrants, uh, to name a few. Knowing this, the city did secure that $40 million, and we are making that a comprehensive reach into our neighborhoods. Almost half of that funding was set aside for trusted organizations throughout our city to do targeted outreach. This became the complete count fund. The last time we all met, the awardees had not yet been announced. In December, 2009, 
2019, 157 community-based organizations were selected through a rigorous grant-making process to conduct targeted census outreach. Those organizations spent the first months of 2020 planning for the beginning of the self-response, which was gonna happen in March. As Chair Cabrera said, uh, the coronavirus already was making its way through the city at that time. And with New York on pause, the city and our census partners have had to make creative adjustments to those plans that they first developed. The need for a complete count has not disappeared. Uh, and so we're making it evident with today's discussion. Uh, we are incredibly thankful for our staff. I wanna give them one last shout out. Uh, but the final thing I wanna say is this. What we need to do right now is figure out how we use every resource and even call upon the state for the resources that we have yet to see on the ground in our city and in our state. And so where is that accountability on the state and on us as government to pull those resources down? People are gonna be hustling in the next few days uh, until the 16th at 6 a.m. What are we doing to fuel them to get that count? I'll leave it at that. Thank you uh, to my hermana, Carolina Rivera, uh, co-chair. Uh, and to my hermano, uh, Chair Cabrera. Thank you so much to both of the co-chairs. I can't say enough of your efforts, your leadership, uh, and you were upfront and uh, in the cutting edge dealing with this issue. So I salute uh, both of you. Let me uh, recognize who have been joined uh, by Council Members Powers and Yeager. And now I will turn it over to our moderator, Committee Council C.J. Murray, to go over some of the procedure items. Thank you, Chair. I am C.J. Murray, Council to the Committee on Governmental Operations. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. The first panelist to give testimony today will be representatives from the administration, the Manhattan Borough President's Office, the Queensboro President's Office, the United States Census Bureau, and the city's public library systems. For the administration, testimony will be provided by NYC Census 2020 Director and Executive Assistant Corporation Counsel, Julie Menon. In addition, the following NYC Census 2020 representatives will be available to answer questions. Deputy Director Amit Baga, Field Director Kathleen Daniel, and Grants Program Director Allison Grant Turek. Also available to answer questions for the administration will be Department of Citywide Planning Chief Demographer Joseph Salvo. In addition, testimony will be provided by Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and Director of Immigrant and Intercultural Affairs for the Queensboro President Susie Tannenbaum. For the U.S. Census Bureau, New York Regional Director Jeff Baylor will be providing testimony. And for the public library systems, testimony will be provided by Jin Han Bay from the Queens Public Library, Jay Brandon from the New York Public Library, and Iman Poe Maynard from the Brooklyn Public Library. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if a council member would like to ask a question of the administration or specific panelists, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes the panelists to answer your question. Please note that for ease of this virtual hearing, there will not be a second round of questioning outside of questions from the committee chairs. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Before we begin testimony, I will administer the oath. Director Menon, Deputy Director Baga, Field Director Daniel, Grants Program Director Turek, and Chief Demographer Salvo, please raise your right hand. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Menon? I do. Deputy Director Baga? I do. Field Director Daniel? I do. Grants Program Director Turek? I do. Chief Demographer Salvo. I do. Thank you. I would now like to invite NYC Census 2020 Director Julie Menon to testify. Director Menon, we ask that you please summarize your written testimony, which has been added to the public record in full, so as to prioritize 
time for questions. You may be good okay. one ready. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So first of all, I want to thank Chair Cabrera and I want to thank the Census Task Force co-chairs, Rivera and Menchaca, and all the members of the council here today. I'm Julie Menon, Director of the Census and Executive Assistant Corporation Council at the City Law Department. So in the interest of time, I will summarize. I want to say that obviously we speak to you today under the very shameful and maddening situation where the Supreme Court has cut short the census by a full two weeks. Um, at the deadline, just to be clear, is at 6 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on October 16th. So we literally have two days to reach every New Yorker to let them know that this deadline uh, is indeed the, the true deadline and we wanna make sure to get every New Yorker to respond. But I will say, despite this troubling decision and despite literally every single obstacle being thrown at us, including being the epicenter of a global pandemic, I'm incredibly proud to share that our first um, citywide effort of its kind has uh, achieved a response rate, and I'm using yesterday's numbers because we'll get new numbers today, of 61.4%. So to put that into context, that basically means we have met where we were in 2010 when there was no global pandemic. We beat the US Census Bureau's pre-COVID estimate. They estimated before COVID that New York City would be at 58%. We beat that by 3.4 percentage points. And in addition, we've aggressively narrowed the gap to five points. So we're five points behind the country. In 2010, we were 14 points behind the country. So that is um, significant progress and a true testament to the citywide partners, all of the different organizations, elected officials, the true partnership that we had, um, and to New Yorkers as well who responded. I do want to say to also put this into context, we are ahead of Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Atlanta, Orlando, Miami, Detroit, Houston, Dallas, and so many other cities. So it's really important to note that um, as well. So in terms of where we are, and again, I'm, I've submitted my full testimony, but in the interest of time, want to be brief on this. Staten Island currently holds the highest self-response rate at 66.1% ahead of its 2010 rate of 62. At 62.5%, Manhattan currently holds the second highest rate. It is lower than 2010, and it's lower than 2010 in large part because some Manhattanites left um, the borough during COVID and did not fill out the census. We work very closely with the Manhattan Borough Presence Office, with the Board of Elections, and we got absentee ballot information and we mailed those individuals, we phone banked them, and we sent text messages as well to reach out to them. Um, before uh, Queens is currently in third place with a self response rate of 62.3 ahead of its 2010 number. Um, the Bronx is at 62% and Brooklyn is in fifth at 58.6. But I do want to note that Brooklyn now is three full percentage points ahead of where it was in 2010. I'm really proud to uh, report that a large majority of black communities throughout New York City are exceeding their 2010 performance. So that is really important. I, I won't spend time going through every single community, but certainly if we look at Co-op City in the Bronx, currently has a self-response rate of 76%, nine points ahead of the national average. So that's really something um, very significant as well. I want to talk for a minute about some of the strategies that our team employed uh, post-COVID. So one of the things that we quickly had to do is when COVID hit, we clawed back $1.3 million from a signed contract we had on Subway ads. So we had a signed contract, but we were able to get that money back and pour it into digital and TV. We also um, had procured before COVID a text messaging system called Hustle. Our team has sent 7.1 million text messages through Hustle. We have a predictive dialer and we have phone bank 3.1 million New Yorkers. And I think that has made an enormous difference. We also moved to building a new campaign to reach New York's many immigrant communities. We created chat. Um, chat rooms, both in WhatsApp and Kakao Talk and in WeChat. We also worked with our Complete Count Fund, um, where we had over 157 community groups that we funded. And we worked very closely with them and our citywide partners to launch these chat groups in 15 different languages. Our whole advertising campaign. So I'll talk for a minute about that. 
Um, we thought it was so important to do our advertising campaign. We had 34 different campaigns. We had everyone from Cardi B to Alicia Keys in terms of celebrities, Lin-Manuel Miranda. But then we also had local New Yorkers really talking about what the census meant to them. We advertised in 27 different languages. Um, we also ran ads on 150 different websites. So we think this was very important as well. Um, and I think that the ads uh, really resonated because one of the things that we did with our digital ads is we monitored them in real time and changed them out quickly. So the ones that were resonating, we kept on longer. The ones that were not, we quickly changed the map. Our team has also been doing robocalls. We've done robocalls with a number of different key influencers. I'll mention one of them. We saw great success with our robocalls with Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. For literally $1,000 investment, we were able to reach almost 40,000 residents in, in the New York 14 district, um, hundreds of which opted to be directly patched in. So we did a direct patch through directly to the Census Bureau so people could respond directly on the spot. I do wanna mention um, that I believe it to be true that we are probably the first and only jurisdiction in the nation to ensure a nearly complete count of residents experiencing homelessness. And we also believe that we are among the very few cities to ensure a complete count of all residents living in public housing. The way we were able to do that is we entered into an unprecedented legal agreement with the Department of Social Services and the Census Bureau so that um, on the homelessness issue, we could make sure that the Department of Social Services provided a complete accounting of all of those in the shelter population to the Bureau. I can tell you that did not happen in 2010. And as a result, many in the homeless community were left behind. In we brokered a similar data transfer between NYCHA and the Census Bureau. This is first of its kind. We think this should honestly be a national model that other cities should utilize. And we think that this is incredibly important to make sure that all of our residents in public housing were um, indeed counted and not left behind. Um, so then again, in the interest of time, I will skip forward and just talk a little bit about the work that we have done with our partners. We had the most unbelievable partners in this effort. I'm so proud of our complete count fund. As I mentioned, we quickly were able to put in place a process to grant to 157 community organizations, as well as our citywide partners. And these were trusted community voices on the ground that we were able to work with. In addition, we worked with 1,000 houses of worship we worked with labor unions, we worked with elected officials, we worked with community leaders all across the city of New York about the importance of the census. And I think you really see um, the, it's a testament to where we are as a city in terms of census response uh, numbers. So um, I will end on the note by saying that Look, we have basically 48 hours to go. Every single minute in the next two days counts. We don't want any New Yorker to be left behind. While the NERFU numbers um, indicate that New York State as a whole is approximately around 98%, um, again, we know that the door knocking data is simply not as reliable as self-response. So that is why our team has worked so hard to get to the self-response number that we're at. And that is why we're proud that we have been able to close the differential in the nationwide competition, largely between the nation and New York City versus 2010, and why we're very proud of the work that we've done to compare to other cities. So I will end on that note. And of course, we and my team are happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Director Menon. Next, we will have questions from Chair Cabrera, followed by Council Member Rivera, and then Council Member Menchaca. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Chair Cabrera, please begin. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna be a bit unorthodox and I'm gonna uh, have uh, the co-chairs of the census, Council Member Rivera and Menchaca uh, to go first. So with that, uh, let me turn it over uh, to Council Member Rivera, one of the co-chairs. Then I'll come back at the end. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, um, everyone who is here. I am 
I'm really proud of, of the work that we've done. And I realized that this was an unprecedented pivot. So I just want to ask a few questions in terms of uh, engagements and pledges and, and some of the marketing material. So I'll start there. So to date, how many total engagements, pledges, and completes have CCF awardees reported to the administration? Sure. So I'm going to have Allison Tarek, who ran our grants program, talk a little bit about that. Thanks so much, Julie, and, and thank you, um, council member. Um, you know, it's been wonderful to be a part and of this entire uh, program, and we are so thankful to the city council for your um, significant contribution to the Complete Cloud Fund. It would not have been possible without you, and we um, are so happy to be here today to speak about it. So thank you. Um, you know, the, the Complete Cloud Fund program officially ended just two weeks ago, so we are continuing um, to compile our, our final metrics and work with the awardees as they submit their closeout reports. Uh, clearly, um, until yesterday, we thought we'd be working with them um, and getting those metrics throughout the month. Um, now, as we wind down these next two days, um, we're continuing to support them um, as they do their civic engagement work. Um, but I will say that preliminary indicators show um, that we are very confident in the success of the Complete Count Fund. Uh, many of them um, use our VAN um, database um, to report completes. Um, and they also reported what are um, called soft completes, meaning that they perhaps didn't get the name of the person, but they were able to say, we spoke with 20 people who said they completed the census today. So as we um, compile that data, we will ensure the city council receives it uh, by the end of the month. Uh, but we will say that uh, we are really um, pleased with the work um, as um, Director Menner said, as 157 groups, um, it's in the hundreds of thousands. Um, and we're just refining that data now and we'll be sure to get it to you as soon as possible. I understand. And I'm just asking because I wonder, you know, sometimes <clears throat> when I was out there trying to engage with people with the US Census Bureau or with members of your team, um, sometimes like getting a pledge card like wasn't the easiest thing. So, mm -hmm. you know, people still wanted to participate for sure. So I just ask in terms, I guess what I really wanna know is what were some of the most effective ways um, that you found uh, outreach to be, to be successful? And I'll give you one example. I'm very curious as to maybe how we uh, collaborated creatively, for example, the board of elections and people requesting absentee ballots. Are we able yeah. to work with them in order to- Sure, so I'm gonna, Thank you so much for that question. I'm gonna talk about the Board of Elections because one of the things that we were really struck by, if you look at the Manhattan numbers, if you look at the numbers on the Upper East Side and Midtown and Soho and other parts of Manhattan, they are lower than they were in 2010. And so clearly we knew that there was a situation where some um, Manhattanites had left um, Manhattan and had either done one of two things, either they didn't fill the census out at all or they filled it out from the location they were at because the census form talks about an April 1st deadline and where you are. And we had heard anecdotally that many New Yorkers uh, did not fill it out correctly and filled it out from the second location that they were at. So we work with the Manhattan Borough President's Office. We went to the Board of Elections. We requested the absentee ballot data and we did three things with it, uh, a mailing, to those individuals about the urgency of the situation, telling them they needed to fill it out as uh, Manhattanites. And if they had erroneously filled it out, they needed to go online and correct it and fill it out as a Manhattanite. Two, we phone banked them. And three, we texted them. So we really did a tremendous amount of outreach and we did see the Manhattan numbers start to move as a result of it, but it's still a very stubborn problem. The other part of your question is that I think you were talking about what outreach um, methods did we find most efficacious? And I will say, um, we also ran a paid canvas operation. And one of the reasons we did that is we did not wanna wait for the federal government to start door knocking. Obviously during the height of COVID, we could not be out there having that kind of in-person contact that normally we would. But as soon as some of the restrictions started to lift mid um, summer, we decided to bring out our own paid canvas operation. And that was highly effective and I think really moved the needle. And if you look at our numbers and how New York City was actually ranked number one in terms of movement of any major city over the summer. And I really attribute that 
to a lot of the different outreach uh, tactics, whether it's the phone banking, the texting, or the paid canvassing. So we really started to see those numbers move. So would you say that's one of the most effective ways that I understand that the in-person canvassing to me is super effective, right? As someone who has campaigned on a, on a different issue, um, but slightly related, um, I'm just trying to figure out in terms of our investment and how we pivot, right? You had a very, very large marketing budget. You certainly were going to utilize some of those tools. For example, you used Hustle to send text messages. Um, but how did you, I guess, also support those community-based organizations who were going to be very, very reliant on in-person outreach and who suddenly sure. kind of yeah. change up what they were doing? And I asked because just one second, I asked because um, a lot of them don't have a, a, a digital content manager. You know, they don't mm -hmm. have a robust social media presence. And so you can do a, a thousand robo, uh, uh, you know, a robo call for a thousand dollars and get 40,000 people reached. How many people, and you say people were asked to be hundreds Time. of people attached in um, to, to directly get their census completed. So I ask, I'm just asking, what was the more, most effective and how did you support those community-based organizations? Many of whom I think are still awaiting the rest of their award. If sure, may, so um, yeah, Allison and Amit, do you wanna take that? And, and just the last thing I'll just say since I'm, I'm out of time is, I wanted to know how, how you will determine which absentee ballot requesters you sent census flyers to, to remind them. I'm just wondering how you utilize that data. Thank you. Well, I'll speak to the first part and then Director Menon is the best one to speak to, the, to that last question, um, council member. Um, you know, as, as you said, um, the complete count fund, community-based organizations, these are true grassroots organizations. These are groups that had budgets as an entity from anywhere from 50K, then much larger ones like in the millions, for instance, help in um, organizations like SOMOS. Um, so these organizations look to us, they, not all of them had digital directors. Um, many um, had to furlough staff um, with the pandemic. Um, just as we shifted um, our work um, for our field team, um, which field director Danielle, I'm sure will speak to, um, we also work to provide support to each of our um, CBOs that we work with closely. Um, you know, they, were, they went online. Um, we worked with them. We provided them with amazing graphics and social media toolkits that our digital team put together. Um, we provided them in a multitude of languages, um, along with ensuring that our CCF awardees were proofing um, the languages to ensure that translations were correct and spoke to their communities. Uh, further, um, we supported them um, with providing um, use of our Google Meets and our Zoom to ensure they could do virtual events. Um, many of us spoke on them. And then as um, we saw the city starting to reopen in June, we provided them with guidance to go back in person. Some of them just um, weren't capable or um, able to have their staff go out in the field, but we did provide guidance. Um, we provided PPE. Um, we provided um, our own staff and volunteers to ensure we could help them with tablets at their in-person census outreach. Um, and like you said, th these groups were not necessarily um, digitally um, you know, ready to go on day one, but we provided a lot of trainings. We provided a lot of online support. Um, our data team provided a lot of technology support as did our citywide partners, uh, specifically the NYIC. Um, we were able to ensure that our um, CCF awardees were able to use those virtual tools um, to get to all members of the community. They were able to upload their own lists, um, contact their own list and communities, um, memberships, clientele. Um, when they did so, they got very, very high um, response rates. Um, also, as they did their calls around casework, um, they were able to check in on individuals. How are you doing? How's your health? Do you need food? Do you need A, B, or C? And oh, by the way, can you do the census? So really the reason why the selection committee chose these organizations is because they are part of the communities that they serve. They speak the language. Um, they look like one another. They know each other. They're known entities. They trust each other. Um, and that's why we think that the CCF um, as a metrics are coming together. Um, we're really proud of the work that the Complete Cal Fund has done. And I want to say that all the council members and Chair uh, Cabrera, how you've all spoken to that as well, that this partnership has been unique. And um, we've really provided the tools, um, weekly um, check-ins with every organization and, and more regularly if needed. Uh, so we're, we really think that they were able to take advantage of the virtual tools, even if they didn't have the expertise prior. And then we were able to help them get out in the field once it was safe. Um, I'll quickly jump in to answer your last question. Um, in terms of how we selected 
um, who is going to be contacted. Um, we were able to get from the Board of Elections uh, information about everyone who had requested an absentee ballot um, who was registered. <laughs> New York City who, want, who had asked for ballot and for the June primary, but asked for um, an absentee ballot to be sent to them outside of the five boroughs. So obviously we know there were a lot of people who requested it who were still here because they didn't want to actually go to the polls. Um, so we simply contacted everyone who got a ballot outside of the five boroughs, but also while still in the United States. Thank you Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. I'll now turn it back to Chair Cabrera, followed by Councilmember Menchaca. Chair Cabrera, please begin. Thank you so much. Uh, let me acknowledge that. Uh, let me acknowledge that we've been joined also by Councilmember Rodriguez. Uh, let me uh, first, uh, Director Men, thank you. Thank you. You had to before <laughs> you uh, a task that literally require Herculean effort, uh, unprecedented. I don't know in any time in history, U US history when a census was taking place that you had to face what you face uh, alongside with all the advocates that had to do nearly the impossible and to be able to end up uh, with the results that we have received so far. And I'm hopeful that in the next 24 hours, uh, we'll be able to move the needle. Uh, and this is why I'm glad that we're doing this hearing today. And for all the members of the media, please help us out, get the word out. Most people don't know we have 24 hours. Matter of fact, uh, is there any way possible that we could put forth a commercial in the next 24 hour, I know it's last minute to let people know what are some of the ways that uh, we could reach out to people uh, to let them know that the clock is ticking. Sure, so I'm, hap I'm happy to address that. Um, in terms of putting out a TV commercial, that's not something um, budget wise that we would be able to do. Um, digitally, we are doing that. You know, we are able to use all of our digital assets and digital resources. We have a whole social media toolkit that went out the second we had the new deadline that's been disseminated far and wide. We have reached out to numerous members of the media. There's been a lot of media attention in the last, uh, the since the SCOTUS decision uh, last night and, as well as today. So we are getting the word out. And then obviously we're working with all of our different citywide partners, you know, whether they be in you know, labor, houses of worship or our grantees um, really across the board. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me get to a few questions here today. How many phone calls, and I know you, you touched lightly on it, but if you could give me more detail. Uh, today, how many phone calls were made through virtual phone banking and sure. your computer dialer or two? Sure, sure. Mm, we did three. Uh, let three, me just give oh, you a, real quickly yeah. uh, a battery of them so oh, okay. a little faster because uh, I'm looking for a lot of data. How many unique individuals were reached via telephone? Uh, if you could provide a breakdown of how many phone calls were made and individuals reached by each entity uh, and in what language uh, was phone banking conducted in? Sure, okay. I mean, in, in total, we have used a predictive dialer to make over 3.1 million calls. Um, I will, and, and just on the texting side, 7.1 million text messages using Hustle. Um, and then third, and then we can get into the details of it. The third uh, big bucket is using uh, WhatsApp, Kakao Talk, and WeChat, where we had 15 different languages, um, mm -hmm. conversations on those apps in large part to reach immigrant communities. So I will ask um, Amit Baga to uh, also add in some detail on this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera. Thank you for having today's hearing. Um, so in terms of the exact number of unique New Yorkers uh, or unique individuals that we've reached, we can certainly get that to you right after the hearing. Um, phone banking has occurred in multiple languages. Um, I'll share a list of a few that I know for a fact that we've conducted phone banking in and then Kathleen Daniel, our field director, can add. Um, I know we've done English, Spanish, uh, Mandarin, Cantonese, Punjabi, Bangla, um, I believe Russian, 
Uh, and I know there are some additional ones as well. Kathleen, if you wouldn't mind adding. Sure, I, you, you've pretty much hit most of them. Um, and it, it's, we've also been doing some text banking, um, which we'd love to share some numbers with you on. Uh, we were able to, as well, we can raise an army of over 10,000 New Yorkers that assisted us um, with this program. Fantastic. Uh, in late March, you issued guidance uh, asking complete count fund, CCF, awardees uh, to suspend their in-person outreach efforts and adjust their outreach plans to ensure consistency with public health service directors. Have How have the uh, awardees adjusted to their outreach efforts in response to this guidance? Could you give us some mm -hmm. example and what in-person activity ha have, uh, have been able to proceed as the city has reopened? Sure, so Allison, our grants director will answer that. Thank you, Dr. Brennan, and, and thank you, Chairman Cabrera. Um, yeah, our program, um, we were able to pivot very quickly. Um, the entire team census, as we like to call it, NYC Census 2020, was able to put together a plan, and we were able to effectuate it to ensure that the Complete Health Fund was part of that plan. Um, immediately upon understanding that this pandemic was a reality in mid-March, uh, we were able to issue guidance stating uh, please hold an all in person, just as you said, Chairman. Um, we issued that very quickly. We had several conference calls. Um, we wanted to ensure that um, they knew that our guidance was like, we don't expect you to be in the streets. There's a pandemic. Um, and we um, really got a lot of positive feedback from the awardees that we were understanding as a grant maker that we wanted to shift with them. So we were able to use the tools that some of my colleagues have been speaking to. We were able to ensure all were comfortable with using hustle to text that they were able to upload their own list of their of their membership. Um, they started using the phone banks um, even more than we had planned. We got the predictive dialer. They had their own predictive dialer events as well as join the ones that our field team organized specifically focused on different communities. So over the first uh, three months of census collection, our um, complete count fund remained um, virtual as did the rest of our work um, across team census. And uh, they were able to do virtual events, um, town halls, um, and really, it, it's, the, it, it's in the hundreds, the number of events that took place over those three months online, which was really quite remarkable. Um, and then really, in terms of outreach in person, as soon as we issued the guidance, uh, we found that many of our CCF awardees, either they had already been um, food distribution centers, or they opened up new food distribution centers at their locations in order to serve the communities that they are in. Um, and, they, and they were able to... Um, pivot and have either our team members or themselves collect census and insist um, individuals um, with census intake at those food distribution points. Um, we found that we were able to um, ensure that um, people receive the services they need and that they understood the importance of the census and getting the money and the power and the respect that each of them deserve um, as they were waiting for their very much needed resources. Um, and then we were able to just do um, some other like really great things like virtual DJ parties and in-person um, uh, drive throughs to do your census and, and receive a, a raffle bag for your children full of toys donated by local um, institutions. Uh, there was a lot of creativity, a lot of car care events that the Complete Count Fund was able to pivot. Uh, and we're really um, just really have been taken away by the work that they've done despite the circumstances. So you had a DJ party and we were not invited? <laughs> We're gonna protest here. This is an injustice. I believe they were all invited. Level. And I will say it was the CCF individual organizations who hosted. Um, if we had someone <laughs> ourselves, they would have made sure you would invite chairman. Um, um, on the okay. distribution front, if I could just add very briefly, I think that this is a very important point. Um, our team started to actually go out to food distribution sites starting in late May, because we knew that's exactly where New Yorkers were. The unfortunate reality of the situation with COVID-19 is that it's created an economic crisis that has obviously caused food insecurity to rise tremendously here in New York City. Um, but we knew that that's where we needed to reach people. Uh, and so as a result, we've participated in more than 150 food distribution or mask distribution events um, over the summer. And these were almost exclusively with immigrant communities and we did provide the correct language support. Uh, I do also think it's worth briefly noting that um, these were important, not just because this is where we were, but also because specifically we know that these are communities where self-response was really, really low. Corona Queens is a good example of this. Um, where you know it's been sort of at the bottom of the list in terms of all of the neighborhoods across the city. 
for, for good reasons, and I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but, you know, we were helping to fill out the census for households there that had, you know, anywhere from six to 12 members on average, which is, you know, a huge, huge number per household. And so um, I think it just goes to show that some of, you know, some of these types of events that were really done in partnership with those parties were really important and very otherwise hard to read. Uh, thank you. At this moment, I'm going to turn it over to the task force co-chair, uh, Council Member Menchaca, and I'll come back with some more questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cabrera and Co-Chair Rivera. Uh, I want to say thank you to the census team. You've all been doing incredible work, and I hope you feel that that love and appreciation. Th this was not easy. We went in with so much um, wind behind us and resources, and you were dealt the most crazy hand possible. And so I want to just let you know I'm, I'm appreciating that in, in a very real way. What, what I'm still curious about, and I had to step back into my other immigration hearing on adult literacy, is the connection with the state and the governor. Have you all answered that question and really kind of thought about how we can hold that administration accountable in this moment for the funding that could have actually helped so much in our and could help in the next few days if that kind of funding was available to the operation, the beautiful operation that you've built in every borough? Well, first of all, thank you so much, council member, for the kind comments. We really appreciate it. Our team has, um, I mean, it's not an overstatement and it's not trite to say we've literally worked around the clock uh, for months and months and months on end. So we deeply appreciate the comments and we deeply appreciate the partnership with the city council, which has really meant a lot to us. Um, in terms of the state, the state was uh, set to allocate funding before COVID and then COVID hit and, you know, I don't need to restate obviously what happened. We all know what happened. Um, the state has allocated through the bar president's office. So I know you're going to be hearing from the bar president. So I, you know, defer to them in terms of their comments on that funding. Um, so that's basically where, where things are. So no communication from the state at all about that funding? Uh, no, I don't want to say there's no communication. I mean, you know, we do talk to the state um, about census, obviously, and it's a, it's a top priority for us, but we don't control those funding decisions, so it wouldn't be my place to comment on them. Okay. Um, you know, my colleagues have asked a lot of the a lot of the, the, the kind of good questions about how the on the ground operations work. Maybe my my question is really about the places that you saw uh, that were not working. That that you can kind of give us an example of what what uh, initiative was launched and you saw just no no reaction to. Um, I have my my experiences in in the in the district in Sunset Park. Uh, to Ahmed's point, there are places like Corona Queens that are were impacted greatly by by COVID, uh, and the deaths there are are real. Um, the fear is real. Ice ice raids have have been real in communities like Sunset Park, and and so we were trying to in real time figure out ways of communicating these messages. Are there things that did not work at all in your experience? I don't have an example of something that didn't work at all. I would say perhaps if I were to identify the number one biggest challenge we had, it was combating um, obviously the challenges we had with COVID and not having the in-person contact that we needed in March and April and May to combat the Trump administration's misinformation. You know, we needed that in-person contact for someone who was reluctant to fill the census out. Look, we phone bank them, we text them, we can have that virtual, but there's nothing like that in-person human contact with a trusted advisor that we were not able to do in March and April and in in May. As Amit mentioned, um, in late May, we did go out to food distribution sites and we were able to begin that work. But that work we couldn't do in March and April. And so in the beginning of the census where other states weren't battling COVID and weren't battling what New York City was battling, we were not able to have that precious in-person contact that we sorely needed. If I may, um, I think Director Dimenin touches on a point that's that's really critical here. What we experienced was a lack of, of feeling safe 
from all New Yorkers, be it from the threat of COVID or the threat of the misinformation and the campaign to scare them from doing the census. And what we found, um, while we didn't experience a tactic that did not work at all, um, which, which is astounding and, and uh, we're very proud of that difficult work. What we did experience when our team went out to canvas and knock on doors was that people were less comfortable because they were coming to the door without masks um, and, and not being dressed in the same way that they would be, of course, if they were in the street. We found community canvassing to be far more effective, which is different from the type of campaign and, and direct constituent contact or resident contact that we're used to. Um, so when right. people were already out and already wearing PPE, and already dressed a certain way, they were prepared to stop and have a conversation and happy to do so. So we found that direct communication was still the key and one of the, the most successful factors, but not door to door, but mano a mano in the street. Yeah. And have, well, that's, have that's you key. and other council members join us for much of that. <laughs> Yeah. If I could just add very briefly, and thank you again, um, Chairman Chaka, for you know having this hearing today and for all of your incredible work on the census. Um, to Kathleen's point, as Director Menon has alluded as well, there really was no tactic that we think didn't work. And I do want to draw the committee's attention just briefly to some of the advertising communications and marketing that this campaign um, did, which was very different than anything that's been done in the past by any other city entity. Um, very specifically, we ran a campaign into which we pumped real dollars um, that was also very message tested with multiple different communities around the issue of the thousands and thousands and thousands of New Yorkers that live in illegal, largely basement units. Um, by and large, as you know, and as everyone on the committee knows, um, issues that these New Yorkers face are extremely overlapping between poverty and immigration, obviously language access. Uh, and as a result, um, you know, people have a lot of fear about participating in the census. It's a federal government activity um, where someone is asking you about how many people live in your home and, you know, what your address is and all of this. Um, in addition to that, landlords themselves, the owners of these multifamily units that are not actually supposed to be renting out these basement units, often have discouraged or dissuaded their tenants from participating mm -hmm. in the census for fear that somehow they're going to get in trouble with DOB. So for the first time ever, we launched a campaign, which we call Doubled Up, that we did in multiple languages. Um, we did it in Spanish. We did it in Chinese. We did it in Punjabi, Urdu, Bangla, Russian, um, that really spoke directly both to landlords and to tenants living in these situations to say the census is completely safe. There are no questions about immigration. Your information cannot be shared with anyone and no harm will come to you. And just to you know, sort of put a finer point on how we know this campaign was successful, um, the average click-through rate, which is you know, the percentage of clicks that an image is getting when it is being uh, shown online um, mm -hmm. to you know, whomever you're targeting, the average click-through rate you know, for a city campaign is two tenths to three tenths of a percentage point. Average click-through rate for this particular campaign in the non-English languages was anywhere from three to five percent, which is just enormous. I mean, it's several, 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 um, you know, times what the average click-through rate is for a city campaign. So, um, you know, we're very proud of this type of very, very tailored and responsive work. Um, and, you know, the, the click-through rates bear it out, but so do some of the anecdotes and the qualitative response that we got from community members. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, that that's that's really helpful to understand how how the technology works. And and I, th I think we're going to do a post conversation when this is all done, which is going to be sooner than I think we all anticipated. But I think these are going to be really important things to start integrating into other campaigns. So thank you for, for this work and this analysis that you're giving us today. Um, and, and really speaking to this uh, culturally sensitive, but also ling ling linguistic sensitive messaging, uh, what steps did you take to reach non-English proficient New Yorkers? Um, in particular, I'm thinking a lot about our South Asian and Jewish communities. I think that these were communities that uh, all of you were really focused on um, at, the, at the prep site when we we're doing conversations with leaders. Is there, is there things, are there things that you did in those two communities that, that worked really well um, that we can, we can kind of look to now for the rates that, that are coming in? Sure, I'll begin and then I'll turn it over to Amit. I mean, I'll first start with the Orthodox Jewish community because this was something that we, from the get-go before COVID, had a concern about because of the historically low response numbers. We work very closely 
with religious and community leaders and elected officials in those communities. And we made a real concerted effort in terms of granting to organizations that had a lot of deep roots in those communities. Um, and so I think that really has made a difference because there was a lot of cultural resistance to completing the census. Um, that we had to overcome. And that was, you know, very, very difficult to overcome. And it was really with those trusted leaders that it made a difference. We also did a tremendous amount of advertising uh, in terms of Jewish publications, Jewish radio, we did a lot. And, and again, I think that helped to move the needle as well. And I think in the South Asian community, it's really, you know, again, it was so important to have multilingual advertising in a multitude of different community uh, newspapers. Remember, we of the $8 million in advertising, we took 3 million and put it into community media. That is the largest amount the city has ever mm -hmm. spent on community media. And again, I think that that really made a difference. So Amit, I'll turn it to you to add additional information. Thank you so much, Director Menon. Um, it's a great question. I will say, I will emphasize, totally agree with Director Menon that language access was the very, very top priority for this campaign uh, for all the reasons that we know that it had to be. And so we really went above and beyond. Um, we have 34 campaigns in a total of 27 different languages. That is more languages than any city entity has ever done advertising in before to date. Um, and we really wanted to make sure that our language was not simply the language we were presenting was not simply a translation, right? We all know that there are these large translation companies, they spit translations back out and they're sometimes very formal or very inaccessible. So we actually had a very rigorous process by which we put each and every single translation through a native speaker review and proofing process, which frankly did add a lot of time to our work. Um, mm -hmm. It did mean that in some instances, we weren't necessarily able to get some things out as quickly as we wanted. But what we knew is that once that ad was out or that a particular brochure was circulating, that, that, mess, that the language was accessible, it was understandable, um, it was plain language, and it was something that people from the community would really understand. Um, we branched out uh, and advertised in a lot of South Asian languages. Um, so just off the top of my head, and I may miss one or two, and if I do, I'll follow up. Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, uh, Bangla, uh, Nepali. Um, mm -hmm. I believe we did a little, and I know we had some uh, materials in Gujarati as well. Um, we had uh, PSAs that were in Gujarati, Hindi, and Punjabi. Um, and we held multiple, multiple events with lots of different community organizations, both that were part of the CCF and also outside of the CCF that um, I personally spoke in Hindi and Urdu at some of them. I've per personally spoken Punjabi. Um, and I should just note that the CCF itself also, and you know, we're really proud of the selection process and what the selection committee was able to do, they really took a very critical and rigorous look at what the true makeup of the city really is and ensured that we were funding organizations, um, many of which were organizations that were receiving city money for the very first time, right, that really served these communities. So when you talk about the South Asian community, you look at they see rising up and moving, you look at Chaya CDC, um, you look at United Six, you look at Adhikar, I mean, Adhikar in, in Elmhurst could not have been a more successful partner um, that is also true for Chaya. I mean, these organizations really, really poured their heart and soul into organizing locally in their communities in the languages people speak. Um, and it was, it was a tremendous success. And I'll just end by saying um, in Elmhurst, uh, you know, the response where we have a large South Asian population and Jackson Heights response rates higher than we expected in some ways. And in other parts of the city where this, Large, we had large South Asian and Indo-Caribbean communities where the response rates were lagging. Chaya, Drum, uh, uh, also Jahaji Sisters, the Caribbean Equality Project all came in, you know, queer people leading the charge um, at the end of the census process to really get the community yeah. wanted. And in the last few weeks, those numbers really did go up. So I really want to give them some credit for that. This is, this is beautiful to, um, to listen to, to hear, to have watched over time, and again, I, this is the this is the the celebration and the applause applause to your team and and the hard work round the clock. I, I know you did not stop, and and really, this is maybe my last my last question is: Are you planning on really building out a retrospective uh, report on the city census campaign after this is all completed, and and when can we expect that? Uh, partly because 
what I'm hearing really here is that you've all really built a new level and a new threshold and a new, um, a new bar. This is how this whole city should be functioning under these kind of, of, of standards in engaging on all our messaging that if this was in place 10 years ago and that we were going back to a warm apparatus that you wouldn't have to build new ground to connect to these communities, that that trust, even if ice came, even if all the things and the messages that came down, you would have been funneling information and conversation with people who have already been engaged over time. You can, this team alone can build the next uh, pipeline of information and relationships to communities that have never seen this kind of engagement before. Thank you so much, council member. We couldn't agree with you more. We first of all think this should serve as a paradigm for other citywide outreach efforts, um, but also a national paradigm um, on how you can conduct right. census outreach. And we've had many other cities reach out to us um, during this whole process. So obviously we wanna be able to put this in some kind of report because we think it's incredibly important to codify this and have yes. this as the model um, for future endeavors. So yes, we will work on that in the remaining time that we have left. So thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you. Back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it back uh, to the task force uh, co-chair Rivera. Uh, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, director, if you could help us uh, and the staff to give us the, we're gonna do a rapid fire of questions because uh, we know we have borrowed precedents and uh, advocates awaiting. If you could give us like the 30 second answer to each of these questions coming forward, that way we could build momentum and go through these questions. Uh, rather quickly, which I'm sure you would uh, uh, be happy. Uh, yes, sure. This. Thank you so much. Uh, Council Member Rivera. Thank you so much. I just wanted to ask uh, uh, Mr. Salvo, I guess a couple questions if that's okay, or whoever wants to chime in. Um, what do DCP's post census operations look like? Does DCP have a process in place for evaluating the census count in the city after the census is completed? How do DCP support the city census count during the self-response period? And were there any changes in the way that DCP supported the city's census count during 2020 compared to 2010? Um, okay, I'll start with the last question. Um, we published over the course of the census uh, materials in support of the effort that you've, you've heard about. Um, there are 19 reports, they're all up on our website. Um, we looked, evaluated um, self-response rates and then what are called final enumeration rates by neighborhood, providing guidance to many of the people that you've heard from on this call. Regarding um, the post-census evaluation, we're part of an effort that is taking place to try to see how the Census Bureau went from a neighborhood that had a 40 or 50% self-response rate to 99%, because there are many ways that the Census Bureau can so-called close out a case that does not involve necessarily an accurate count of people in housing units. One example, proxy responses, as we call them. A neighbor who provides a count. In general, those counts will be low. In general, those counts may not be accurate. So the result is that the city um, <clears throat> could lose population by virtue of an excessive use of that method. There is a movement nationwide now, there's a group of people and we're involved with that group that are trying to get the Census Bureau to provide us with information on how they completed the enumeration. So right now you have, you have the published materials, you're looking at the proxy responses. Um, I'm trying to make sure I didn't lose anything there in terms of post-census operations, like in terms of working collaboratively. Um, there are a number of ways that the Census Bureau can complete a case. 
to, for a housing unit. They can declare a housing unit to be um, vacant through the use of administrative records or observation. They can uh, delete a housing unit that they find does not exist. They can delete a housing unit by virtue of it being a duplicate. There's going to be a lot of concern about the post-processing of the data collection, which starts in a couple of days, and they're going to have to deduplicate cases. You've heard earlier that we reached out to people beyond the city who live in the city. Many of those people may have actually answered the census in two places. So we want them to be recorded as residents of the city. The Census Bureau will need to do that and we will need to have feedback on what they did. And then finally, as you said, the use of proxy, and I mentioned the use of proxy responses, um, the use of administrative records, for example, from uh, social security, from IRS tax returns, from HUD records, uh, records from Medicare, all of that, those records can be used to actually complete an enumeration. How much of that took place in order to complete the enumeration in the city? All of these things have error associated with them, and we need to learn more about that. Thank you very much. I know, I know we have um, less than 48 hours, so Whatever push there is um, in the next few hours, next couple of days, please, please let us know, of course, how we can be supportive and how we can make sure that we're reaching our constituency. We've tried a lot of different ways. And I know, uh, Mr. Salva, you've been doing this a long time. So in terms of, of lessons learned, and I know we're gonna hear from some others um, on the next couple of panels, uh, we're happy to, to collaborate and, and let you know as to some of our experiences. And of course, you'll hear about that through some of the questions we ask uh, of future panelists and advocates. So thank you so much for your work. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, here comes the rapid fire questions, uh, Director. And so uh, let's start uh, with CUNY. How are the administration and CUNY, uh, how do they, they plan? Uh, how was the use actually rather uh, on CUNY Census Corp students? Uh, how were you able to utilize them? What's the latest update with them? Sure, well, well two things on CUNY. We, CUNY was a, a, a huge partner uh, from the beginning both with the complete count fund um, and helping to administer that. And then through the students, obviously with COVID, that it, it changed the way that the students could interact um, with New Yorkers. And that was an unfortunate reality of COVID. But CUNY had been a fantastic partner and we're really thrilled with the work um, that they and the students have done. I know back in May, you had a, uh, you have stated 178 students have signed up to work did we were able, was that a sustainable number that we were able to retain? Did we get more? Yeah. I'll talk, Ahmed and Kathleen, if you want to add in there. So we had a fantastic experience with our students. We we're able to swell to 220 CUNY students. Um, and when some of them were assigned to our CCF awardees and many of them were assigned to the field team. Um, and then when of course COVID uh, became our reality, many of them uh, were able to move between teams um, so that if they were willing to go outdoors when the some of the restrictions were lifted, they went outdoors with awardees or field team. And many of them not only participated in our phone banks and our virtual events, but they hosted them themselves. So they hosted some great events, participated in our Teleton, uh, participated in our other cultural uh, initiatives like My Uma Counts, um, que cuente mi gente, um, like Conte um, in the Haitian community. So they really were super troopers and became leaders themselves, leading knock meetings, um, which are our neighbor, neighborhood organizing mm -hmm. census committees, um, and being the knock in some places, uh, because we had clusters of students, of course, um, from specific historically undercounted communities. Um, so very proud of the work that our CUNY students did, and they became civic engagement leaders throughout our process, many of them still volunteering today, well after their program sunsetted in late August. So we retained the overwhelming majority of them, about 70% through the summer. And then some still um, are with us today in Sunset Park and Diker Heights and are joining our census last call phone banks today and tomorrow. Great, 
Thank you. And, and, uh, and the shorter you can give me the answer, the better, because I have a lot of Sorry. questions. In July, you provided data to the committee and the task force chairs on the Neighborhood Organizing Census Committee uh, recruitment, uh, stating that the administration have recruited over 5,120 NOCC volunteer. Has the administration needed to recruit more volunteers since then? Yes, so, um, and I think as Kathleen mentioned before, we had a total of 10,000 volunteers in our op overall operation. Uh, this was really exciting. Neighborhood Organizing Census Committees was a new structure that our office created to involve 245 different neighborhoods in New York City uh, in the census and really to make sure that neighborhoods are invested in the future of their community. So from what I gather, there are plans for engaging these volunteers and other civic engagement op opportunities? In the future? Yeah, these are obviously very engaged New Yorkers, so we'd love Beautiful. to keep them enga engaged in the future of the city of New York. So let me move on to questions regarding the agency and partnership engagement. Did uh, NYC Census use the availability of real-time self-respond data to adjust to to adjust its outreach as needed? How did it pivot in outreach between collaboration with city agencies and partners in respond to real-time self-response data in shifting public health directives? Um, sure, I'll try to answer in 30 seconds. That's a long question. But, I know, uh, sorry. We, we, no, 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 I'll try my best. We worked with every single city agency. There is no city agency that was not involved and engaged with us on census. Good. And so that is really, really important. Uh, whether it be the Department of Education, the Department of Health, Department of Social Services, I mean, the list goes on and on. And they were all engaged. And yes, of course, we use real-time data. I mean, one of the advantages of having real-time online data every day is it made us more nimble in terms of how we could quickly um, send in teams to neighborhoods that had low self-response rates. Uh, thank you. How was uh, NYC Census collaborated uh, with the Census Bureau to count people living in nursing homes? Sure. So, yeah. Amit, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Yes. So, um, as the director mentioned in her testimony, we have essentially achieved a complete count of everyone in shelter as far as nursing homes is concerned. Um, if the Bureau had trouble reaching out to any of the nursing homes, we would step in and make a call if we needed to. But by and large, the Bureau was able um, to take care of that themselves. Beautiful. Uh, public libraries. What steps has the administration taken to help public libraries conduct census education and all this census related activity amidst uh, COVID-19 crisis? Well, the libraries were a key partner with us. We gave them a grant well before COVID because we knew that the libraries are key disseminators and trusted voices in their communities. When COVID hit, we then worked on a virtual strategy with the libraries, virtual events, the use of social media, the use of email blasts. So they were very helpful to us in terms of that. That's um, good. One thing that was very effective that I think the libraries did was um, they were able to repurpose some of their funds to send out multilingual postcards to targeted census tracts in various boroughs. Mm -hmm. So we really looked at what are the languages that are spoken, what are the response rates, um, and we ensured that the libraries were able to leverage parts of their grant to actually um, print and mail those postcards. Very good. In late May, you announced a partnership with Grubhub uh, Seamless to award 10 gift cards worth $1,000 a piece to New Yorkers who recently com completed the census. In July, you reported that 3,029 New Yorkers had entered the contest uh, and 1,083 New Yorkers have submitted confirmation that they had completed the census. <laughs> have additional individuals conf uh, confirmed completion of the census since then? Yes, because we extended the contest um, after the initial announcement. And then we also extended the contest to include gift certificates from Lyft, from City Bike, from the Museum of Modern Art. So we had other contests running as well. We'd be happy to send over to the committee all of the completions from all the different contests combined, if that's helpful. Fantastic. That will be helpful, really. Thank you. Uh, shareable foundations. Uh, if you could just briefly <laughs> describe the administration's partnerships with shareable uh, foundations since July. Sure. Um, so I'm going to ask Amit to talk a little bit about that because we had numerous 
in discussions with a, a number of different foundations. So, Mip, do you want to take that one? Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we've worked pretty closely with philanthropy throughout this process. They've been really great partners. As I'm sure you know, they've provided funds to many different organizations across the city. We did provide them with a lot of information about our CCF process, obviously nothing that was um, you know, confidential, uh, but really they, you know, they've been great partners. Uh, in terms of since July, um, uh, chiefly it's the Robin Hood Foundation that's been sort of most involved in providing additional funds for activities on the ground, and they have supported both our pig canvassing efforts as well as our robocall efforts. So let me, uh, thank you. Uh, let me jump into uh, questions regarding messaging and marketing. Uh, you answer uh, a few of them, and I thank you for that. Uh, since July. So let me jump into the ones that, are, that we still have outstanding here. Uh, has the uh, NYC census introduced new messaging to ensure a complete count? I just want to make sure I understand the, the question. New messaging in terms of? Uh, to ensure a complete count. Oh, from, uh, in the, you're saying in the, in the last, in this most recent time frame? Yes, since July. Yeah, okay, uh, absolutely. So we constantly change our messaging. I mean, as I mentioned earlier, we ran 34 different campaigns uh, and that was really important because if you keep sending the same message again and again and again, people tune out. So we constantly rotated our digital messaging, our TV messaging, our community newspaper messaging, radio, um, and I think that that really did work. And on the digital, we can tell what worked. We could tell how long people spent on each of our ads, whether or not they click through, uh, because all of our digital ads had a media call to action with a click through directly to the Census Bureau to complete the census. Beautiful, thank you. Uh, in response to COVID-19 crisis, you allow CCF awardee, uh, awardees to make their own and buy uh, and uh, let me take that back to make their own ad buys using 25% mm -hmm. of their budget uh, funds. In July, you said that 21 of them had taken advantage of this uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Since July, were there any additional awardees that utilized their funds for ad buys? And so how many and what languages and groups you were targeting? Sure. Uh, so yes, um, we allowed them to go to a cap of 25%. Um, many did not go that high because they wanted to keep their funding for other things, but they found that it was a good way to pivot their dollars to reach um, the populations that they work with. Um, it was three additional organizations, um, including those that published um, in Spanish, English, and Yiddish. Uh, so they were able to reach different communities um, in their own outlets and in their own languages. Fantastic. Uh, let me uh, turn it over to Council Member Rivera. I believe she has a question. Is that for later, Council Member Rivera? It's for Jeff. I think he's going to testify in the next panel. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, have all the changes to the response deadline af affected your operations? I would imagine that. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is a, a, a can only best be described as an unpredictable roller coaster. Mm. And when you are constantly tell people that the finish line is moving and rotating and changing, it it accomplishes really what they intended from the start, which is confusion and causes people to be fearful. Well, should I respond to this? Why does the date keep changing? Is this legitimate? So it's it's really upsetting that this happened and it's unconscionable and quite frankly, it's shameful. I can only imagine if we didn't have COVID-19, what our numbers we had end up with, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Can I just add to that because I think it's important to state on the record, um, you know, we have an incredible, incredible team of more than 60 very dedicated New Yorkers who have lived through uh, sort of an unspeakable <laughs> psychological uh, battle uh, with this shifting deadline and with COVID. And I think it is just really important for us to thank um, the member of uh, all the members of our team, as well as every employee of every CPF uh, awardee and my partner for uh, their tenacity in dealing with constantly. Indeed, they need to be uh, affirmed, acknowledged, celebrated. Uh, truly, many of them took risks. Uh, I know I had an event uh, in my district and uh, um, 
workers came out, you know, we're out there in the public and there's a level of exposure and risk uh, they were taking. So I salute every single one of them and uh, a tremendous effort that they put forth. And that's why we see the results that we're seeing right now, even under the circumstances that we're working uh, with in a city that literally got hit the, the hardest when it came to COVID-19. Only got a couple of more questions. You'd be happy to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, NYC uh, census planning to issue a comprehensive retrospective report on the city census campaign after the count is completed? And so when do you expect it to be completed by? Yes, we will issue a report and um, I can't give you the exact date because honestly, the next 48 hours, we're just focused on getting the count out, but mm -hmm. we have always intended to do the report and we will issue it as soon as humanly mm -hmm. possible. As a matter of fact, I believe that's my last question. The rest will send it. Um, we'll, we'll send it. I know you're busy, <laughs> as you can imagine. I don't want to hold you any longer. I know you're dying to get back uh, to uh, control center, if I may <laughs> call you. it. I, I, I thank you. I really, from the bottom of our hearts, I know from our community, to all your staff, uh, fantastic, fantastic work. Um, I can only imagine um, the pressure that you were working on and, and, and really you should be applauded uh, for the work uh, that it was done. And I'm sure we'll hear that from the advocate, uh, from the other groups that were directly involved in the front line. And uh, so with that, I, I turn it back to the moderator, but thank you again. I can say thank you enough. Uh, literally, this is going to bring resources to our districts and as council elected officials. We we fully know uh, the impact that these uh, fundings, federal funding, uh, will have in our district, and we need it more than ever. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera. Thank you for having us today. Thank you. Let me turn it over to the moderator. Moderator at this point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on council members in the order they use the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. You'll have a total of five minutes to ask your question and receive an answer from the panelists. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. Once I've called on you, please wait until the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. Seeing no hands raised, we'll now turn to testimony from the borough president's offices. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. The first panelist to testify will be Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, followed by Director Susie Tannenbaum from the Queens Borough President's office. Borough President Brewer, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. So thank you very much to uh, thank you very much to Council Member Cabrera, and I truly want to thank Julie Menon and her staff, and Jeff Baylor, and Billy Golden, and Joe Salvo. Um, I'm just going to summarize because I know that you're going to get a copy of our presentation. We know that there's millions of dollars. We know that representation is all at stake. Uh, I think you know that uh, Manhattan in 2010 we had that 66.2 percent self-response rate. And right now, today, it's 62.5. So we're really, um, you know, lacking tremendously. So what we have tried to do, we obviously heard earlier from Julie Menon about the New Yorkers who relocated out. It really was us that called the department, the Board of Elections. Uh, we got the 35,000 names of those who had left from the June primary, as you heard. Uh, we helped pay the cost of the mailing. Uh, we did it with the League of Women Voters because so it's a very impartial group and they did get a pretty good uh, response. You have to know though that that is the census tract, those are the census tracts that in the past responded 75% and now it's around 50%. So you can see that's why particularly in Manhattan, our numbers are lower. I think we were the only borough to do that and I certainly want to thank everybody who participated. We also mailed postcards at our own expense, the borough president's office, to 240,000 Manhattanites who live on the lowest performing 
uh, census tracts and they were sent first class so that they would not uh, get lost and other reasons you can imagine. Uh, we also bought ads in the East Hampton Star and other papers in Connecticut, upstate New York, trying to say, fill out your census with your Manhattan address. Um, we also worked hard, as you can imagine, with the Manhattan Complete Count Committee in the very beginning. And as Carlina Rivera knows, we went to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, even a couple of years ago, Jeff joined us to say, how are you doing it in Providence? Because you are the pilot for the online action. Uh, with our uh, Manhattan Action Fund, which is our nonprofit, we did our own uh, allocation of funding. And September 29, we awarded uh, money to 12 organizations. And then you heard recently about the governor's funding. It was a lot less than what we expected. Uh, and it came in late, but we were the first borough president to get the money out. We got it out in August. Uh, that was money from the Empire State Development Corp. And we uh, gave $215,000 to 15 uh, additional organizations, and as you can imagine, we were out on the street with them. I think you heard earlier how important the in-person is. There's nothing uh, to uh, do anything but make sure that's how it works. So um, we also had back to day action. We went to almost every single school in the borough of Manhattan on I'm September sorry. 29th. And so those are some of the ways, in, in addition to census cookies. So we're very depressed about the uh, a short time frame, but to give you some ideas of what we have accomplished. Finally, I just want to say we went to Revney, we went to all the building management companies in Manhattan, where it was hard to get in, and between 32BJ and Revney, we really were able. That's not self-reported, but it got enumerators in, and it also gave an idea about who's in that apartment, at least by name, by uh, enumeration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will hear testimony from Director Tenenbaum. Director Tenenbaum, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Um, it is my privilege to present this testimony on behalf of our President Lee. Good afternoon and thank you Chair Cabrera and members of the committee for convening this public hearing on the importance of the 2020 census to the five boroughs of New York City. This census has been quite a journey, particularly for the borough of Queens. In March, when the coronavirus hit, we found ourselves at the epicenter of the epicenter of the pandemic. Not surprisingly, neighborhoods like Corona and Elmhurst with high levels of COVID-19 had low self-response rates in the census. Queens is tremendously proud to be the most ethno-racially diverse county in the continental US. But when it comes to the census, our exceptional diversity presents unique challenges. In this political climate, even after the federal government's failed attempt to add a citizenship question to the census, our undocumented immigrants and our mixed status families were reluctant to be counted. Also, our African-American communities in Southeast Queens and the Rockaways have historically been undercounted and initially response rates were persistently low. Yet Queens was determined to secure its fair share of federal funding through the 2020 census. Already in November of 2018, my predecessor, the Honorable Melinda Katz, announced the formation of the Queens Complete Count Committee, a diverse and vibrant network of trusted community partners committed to ensuring that their neighborhoods get counted. And my office has fully sustained this commitment. Since February of 2019, the Queens CCC has met on a regular basis, strategizing across neighborhood and cultural lines. We have benefited from the expertise of many great colleagues at NYC Census 2020, the US Census Bureau, the Population Division at City Planning, ABNY, and Queens Public Library. Our trusted community partners have been incredibly resilient. When the pandemic hit, they moved their census outreach to virtual platforms. Our office partnered with NYC Census 2020 on a weekly phone bank that contacted over 40,000 Queens households. When socially distant in-person activity became permissible again, my team joined with our census colleagues and distributed thousands of branded masks and hand sanitizers while providing questionnaire assistance at food distribution sites and transit hubs. 
funding from the city council, the mayor's office, the governor's office, and the borough president's office has been essential in helping our community partners to launch their own rigorous and creative get out the count campaigns. All of these efforts have paid off, whereas Queens ranked number four among the five boroughs for approximately one year, we are now virtually tied for second place with Manhattan. As of this week, our census self-response rate is 62.3%, which is above- Time's expired. Which is above the city average of 61.4%. Can I say two last sentences? The federal government's decision to bring this critically important process to a screeching halt is devastating to our borough and city. Thousands of Queens residents will lose their chance to self-respond, but rest assured that our borough level operation will continue until the very last moment when the census portal closes. And we thank you for your support. Thank you uh, so much. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, can, can, I don't know if you mentioned it, I, I, I don't recall. Do, do you happen to know uh, and clarify how much of a census grant that you receive from New York State to either one of uh, your borough office? Yeah, we got 215,000 in Manhattan. Okay, and for Queens? And we were allocated almost 500,000 uh, uh, given the, the diversity and the, the uh, at populations that were at risk of being under candidate. We received almost half a million. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's impressive. Um, I want to thank you uh, both. Uh, I happen to know uh, Borough President Brewer since she was a council member. And I, I, I can tell you, I, I don't know any harder working elected official uh, than uh, Borough President Brewer. Uh, so I know you gave it all you had in there and on their very unusual circumstances. So thank you uh, for both of your offices and everything that you have done um, to, to really to get the numbers to where we're at. I don't have any uh, other questions so unless the task force chairs have a questions. I see you now. And so with that, we'll move on. Thank you again. Salute you for your dedication and hard work and and for the results uh, that you got, but we still got less than 48 hours. Uh, so let's keep moving that needle. Thank you. Thank you. Let me turn it back to the moderator. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will now call on council members in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you have not yet raised your hand, please do so now. First, we will hear from council member Kalos. Council member Kalos, you may begin when ready. Thank you. I, I never pass up an opportunity to interrogate our borough president when she comes before the council to testify. Uh, my, my first question is, which is the best borough in the city of New York? And I was kind of disturbed to hear that we had fallen behind uh, and just really appreciate all the hard work. What should we be doing in the next uh, day or so to uh, make sure that Manhattan beats the other boroughs in terms of census response rates? Well, as you know, Council Member Kalos, we, the problem is Staten Island is hard to beat. It has to do with the fact that so many Manhattanites left and I assume Staten Islanders didn't. So I think the answer to your question is, you know, the only thing you can do is keep the pressure on those who have left to fill it out in Manhattan. So whether that's the private school list, which we've tried, the synagogues, the churches, many of which are in your district. So that's what I would do is the, the count problem is those who left, to be honest with you. And the best borough? Well, of course it was the best borough, but I, that's a, says it without saying. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Next, we'll hear testimony from Jeff Baylor, New York Regional Director for the United States Census Bureau. Regional Director Baylor, you'll be given three minutes to deliver your testimony. Please begin once the sergeant announces that the timer has started. Time starts now. <clears throat> Thank you very much, co-chairs, uh, task force members, and, and members of the council. We have over 11,000 partners in New York City on the 2020 census who held over 10,000 events, hosted over 2,600 mobile questionnaire assistance sites, 
and made over 17,000 commitments. And that's just when they partnered with us. It is because of the amazing work of our partners across every borough and every level of government, across every race and ethnicity and houses of worship and across community-based organizations that we should all celebrate the achievements of this census, the most difficult census in our nation's history. The Census Bureau, specifically the, the team at the New York region, thank all of you for your tremendous efforts, your outreach serving as a true trusted voice in your communities. Your efforts have clearly made a difference. And then there's another group I wanna uh, recognize, the group of 17,564 New York City residents who took an oath of confidentiality, completed training virtually, and knocked on doors in their community and their neighboring community which made non-response follow-up a true success. I was asked to give the latest schedule, and of course, as a result of last night's um, announcement has changed dramatically. We will continue to support any planned mobile questionnaire assistance events through tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, October 15th. Any mobile questionnaire assistance support planned for events that were being held October 16th through the end of the month, October 31st, will be canceled. For non-response follow-up, our door knocking activities, we have until 11 p.m. tomorrow evening, October 15th, to knock on doors and collect data via our NERFU operation. We will not have staff enumerating that late, but we will have every remaining case to be resolved in the hands of someone who has work availability both today and tomorrow. As of this morning, we had 2,367 cases to work across New York City, the majority of which are quality control or field verification cases of which 263 were added to our workload this morning. Currently, we're at 99.88% complete on non-response follow-up as of this morning. And I wanna note and stress again, our workload on non-response follow-up is not just cases that have yet to respond, but cases in which there may be a quality issue or we need to verify an address. Internet self-response will be available across the nation through, through October 15th until 11.59 p.m. Hawaii Standard Time or 5.59 a.m. Eastern on October 16th. Phone response will be available uh, for its regularly scheduled time on October 15th. So for English and Spanish language lines, they're available until 2 a.m. Eastern time on uh, Friday, October 16th. And the non-English, non-Spanish language uh, are avail lines are available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern time. Paper responses, for those who still have a paper form, must be postmarked by Thursday, October 15th and received by Thursday, October 22nd. I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide the updates and I look forward to our discussion today. Let me uh, turn it over uh, to uh, the co-chair of the task force, uh, Council Member Rivera. She had a few questions. Hi, Jeff. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to see you. Great to see you too. Um, you've been very busy and I know you'd extend the deadline if you could. So yeah. we'll, just leave, we'll just leave that there. Please, can you share the successes and some of the lessons learned about conducting a safe yet effective in-person non-response follow-up? I know um, we heard from the borough president, for example, that um, this was something that definitely happened in my district that some people were being denied access to some of the apartment buildings. So we thought creatively, we involved 32BJ, we spoke to Revney because of the building managers to make sure that they got that access. That's one example of, of, of like a lesson learned and things we can do differently. I thought about, you know, so, uh, introducing legislation and making sure that they had to be granted access and we just didn't have enough time. Um, but something like that, any lessons learned um, given the last few months? Yeah, there are a couple of things that, that, that stand out. First off, partners who've donated space to allow us to conduct uh, trainings virtually. Now, uh, two pieces of that. First off, the, the training itself, the in-person piece was only about two hours. We had to bring people in, swear them in as a census employee. They take the oath of confidentiality. We give them the device and then we send them home to do their training online. So getting space to do that was extremely helpful. And we've had so many partners throughout the city donate space for those purposes, but also the ability to, to use a space and computers. Many of our, our employees didn't have their own laptops or computers for use at home. So they needed a place to go to and partners uh, did a wonderful and amazing job at providing that space. And, and probably the most important, one of the most important things during non-response follow-up and how our partners support us is exactly what you said. 
getting us uh, access into buildings, uh, you know, providing a, a, a director Menon talked about the ability to provide uh, proxy data from uh, the public housing, uh, which we'll use it in the need uh, in the event we need it uh, at, you know, at the end of the census. Uh, but, but just getting us access has been a tremendous help uh, in ensuring we can knock on doors because outside of self response, the very next best thing is having that conversation at the door and, and collecting that information from someone who lives in that household. How did the, some of the, you had some issues in terms of the NERFU app, but we also know that the Bureau intended to hire roughly 13,000 enumerators in New York City. How many did you end up um, hiring for NERFU? And for example, how, if at all, did the Bureau attempt to recruit individuals who lost their jobs as a result of COVID? Yeah, great question. So we kept our online recruiting systems up um, throughout the COVID crisis. Originally, we were scheduled to take stop recruiting at the end of February. Uh, the decision was made to continue to recruit people, um, you know, through the COVID crisis, because what we were finding is as we we're offering jobs to, to New York City residents, they were no longer interested, or maybe they were in a, uh, a high risk category that wouldn't allow them to go out there and knock on doors in their communities. And we certainly understood that. So what we had the ability to do is to pull certificates to hire some of the most recent uh, individuals in areas um, which we were struggling in, in uh, finding someone to work for us. So we, we were able to pull certificates that had the people who most recently applied uh, because we know they were interested. We know they were wanted to be considered for these positions. Uh, so we were able to do that and, and hire over 17,000 people, uh, enumerators, to work on non-response follow-up. And that's one of the, the, the strategies, um, you, you know, again, I, I know, and don't get me wrong, an extra two weeks, absolutely, we would have got more self-response, but we also front-loaded some things that really were, were a true advantageous uh, to, to get us where we need it, where we're at right now today in terms of non-response follow-up. And the first is we started eight days earlier. We we're supposed to start knocking on doors August 11th. In New York City, we were ready to go. Our offices were up and running. We had staff trained. They were eager to get out there, so we started on August 3rd. We provided incentives. This was not part of our original plan when we were gonna start knocking on doors August 11th. So we, we tried to get those people who were working rather than working 20 hours a week, would you consider working 25 hours a week? Those that were working 15, could you work 20 hours a week? And, and that increased the, the productivity of, of our enumerators. And then um, finally, replacement training. So we did not stop hiring in New York City until September. We were scheduled to stop uh, hiring in, in July, train at the end of July for enumeration to begin uh, August 11th. We continued to hire and train as we lost someone, we hired someone new to come in and take their spot to take that device to ensure we had the maximum amount of people we could have out there knocking on doors. I know we've come a long way from our Rhode Island visit. Um, I guess my last question is, is what were the accountability measures in place um, and what did the Bureau implement to ensure that there, that there was training that really covered the health and safety, safety guidelines that the enumerators had to follow? From what I saw, you know, people were very, very careful um, in terms of those who were going door knocking, for example. What was that training like? Yeah, so it was something that was created kind of on the fly um, because we never had planned on doing virtual training. So there was a module that was specifically COVID-19 related, which talked about, you know, washing their hands. It talked about if they're feeling ill, not going out to work. It talked about how to wear your mask properly. And we provided masks to all of our employees. We even provided masks to our employees to give to respondents in packages of five as they were knocking on door to try to make it safe. Um, you, you know, we, we incorporated social distancing. There's no need for a, a NERFU enumerator to go into someone's home. They can knock on the door and back up six feet. And, you know, even the Center for Disease Control had issued a, a joint statement with our director that opening your door to a census taker was low risk be, as a result of some of these policies and procedures we put in place. Now, it wasn't perfect but because we had some people who didn't want to wear a mask. And as we learned about those individuals, as we were told, uh, from community members, we, we took, you know, the, the appropriate action regarding a uh, lack of following the guidance that, that we provided. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I, I think um, it was it was really, really effective to go and, and meet people where they were at. So thank you for all of your work and, and all the time and, and the commitment that you gave. 
Um, I'm going to turn it over back to the chair, who I think also has a couple questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Rivera. Just two quick questions. Uh, number one, how many mobile questionnaire assistance of the NQA events were conducted in New York City since March 12th? I think you're in mute mode. OK. All right, yeah, so uh, we conducted over 2,600 and still counting. We, we just had one signed up for, uh, for Brooklyn tomorrow, um, but over 2,600 mobile questionnaire uh, assistance events. And I, I have to stress, that is probably the, the one uh, lesson learned. This was not a planned activity of part of the 2020 census. This was something that was developed late in 2019. And I think this was a huge success because our partners, and I see Susie there who I can't, I don't know how many Queens hosted and, and uh, I, I know uh, uh, President, Borough President Brewer as well. Um, that was awesome because, and, and I know Council Member Rivera did some as well, having that trusted person there talking about why the census was so important and then just giving them that ability right then and there. I know New York City Census did their own. Uh, which which were a huge success in communities throughout. So that's something that we definitely need to build off of for, for 2030. How, how does that compare to all the major cities? The Great question. Well, I don't have that data. I can tell you certainly within the New York region, which covers from New Jersey, New York, all the way up uh, into Maine and, and Puerto Rico, uh, clearly New York City had, had the most amount of, of uh, mobile questionnaire assistance sites. Okay, my last question, does the Bureau believe the requested extension into April 30th, 2021 for delivering apportionment counts to the president and into July 31st, 2021 for delivering redistricting data to the states are still adequate? Does it still, by, does it still stand by those requests? Does the Bureau anticipate needing even more time to deliver the data? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, and I it's what, which is one I could answer, but I don't I don't have all the data or the facts. All, all I can tell you is that, you know, back earlier this year when COVID nineteen uh, hit, we provided a plan, a replan, and that replan was based upon statutory relief from that December thirty first date, which is why we extended uh, data collection through October thirty first. I don't know if that that statutory relief will get approved or not. Um, you know, as of right now, as I understand it, December 31st is the date in which we have to provide the apportionment files to the president. And I guess we'll see over the next two and a half months if anything will change. Well, do you have, does the Bureau have enough staff to accomplish that in this short amount of time? Yeah, it's a, again, it's a great question. Unfortunately, that's not something we do in the regions. That's really a headquarters task. And, mm. and certainly, um, I would not be the best one to try to even address that. Thank you. Let me turn it over to the moderator who will be calling up on council members for questions. Thank you, Chair. I would now call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question and you've not yet raised your hand, please do so now. First, we will hear from council member Kalos. Council member Kalos, you may begin when ready. Thank you to the chairs. I guess I just have some very specific and technical questions. All, all, any of the elected officials sitting here have had to deal with a, a much smaller problem and task than you've had to deal with in terms of just identifying people who will go out and vote. And in, in New York State, we have some of the worst voting laws in the country, so it's actually quite difficult to vote, um, at least be, before the pandemic and even now just trying to get an absentee ballot. Now it's gotten easier, but in the primary, it was incredibly difficult too. Uh, so I. I I guess for the census where it's just literally a matter of getting somebody to go online and, and fill out a form, which is incredibly easy and, or, or just call a number. So I guess my question is just what technology did you, are we using, do we use, do we have at our disposal to match up every single address in New York City, New York State with the people who we expect to be living there so that we can do a directed canvas? So uh, directed canvas in terms of census related work or are you talking in terms of polling? And for, for, for census, so, so no, knowing that uh, as of whatever credit report or voter registration record, 
that that Ben Kalos lived at this address. We can't get a response from him, from whoever lives at this address now. Let's do whatever we can uh, to track down the person who we think might live there. Yeah, so I, I think that's some of the analysis that, that uh, Dr. Salvo was talking about earlier that we'll, we'll see um, after the census data are, are tabulated. Certainly, you know, getting someone to self-respond is the best way for someone to fill out the census. It's the best data, the highest quality data at the lowest possible cost. The next best way is knocking on that door and having that conversation with that individual. Now, we know we have administrative records that we can use in the event at the end of the census uh, in which, you know, we have a household that had, has not responded. Um, but but it's not a one size fits all. And in certain areas, their administrative records are very strong. In other areas, primarily the areas where self-response rate is the lowest, this is where the, the administrative records are probably the poorest. And, and that's why, again, working with our partners, and especially, I, I can't stress enough, these mobile questionnaire assistance sites uh, have been fantastic. So we've been working with with the city, um, you know, early in the decade through the, the local update of census addresses to ensure that the city, that the U.S. Census Bureau have every possible address where someone lives or could live, which is the basis of, of ensuring we get a complete and accurate count, and then working with partners as we're knocking on those doors. And, and I know it was a, a common concern. Many people got multiple knocks on their door because we, you know, we believe there may be multiple units within that single family structure, uh, but, but, but weren't converted. So um, it, it, I don't know if that addressed your question. Um, but I, I guess it, the, the frustration, because of the secrecy oaths, et cetera, for census, you are the only ones who have the information on who responded and who didn't. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, due to Title 13, we can't share that information with anyone. So I guess my frustration is, as, as an elected official, where uh, I think I'm in a high information district where there's a lot of administrative information available, but we, we have fallen behind. And so I guess it's just frustration. I just a question of just like, how can we just target those who have been unresponsive? And in, in the campaign world, if I want a voter, if I if I can't get them at the door, I'm going to buy the, I'm going to get their email address, I'm going to call their mobile phone, hell, hell, I'll even call their family members until I get that person to respond. Uh, and, and that's just talking about a vote, not like whether or not we get billions of dollars in federal funding. So I guess it's just how can we use the same tools and technologies that many of the elected officials here have used in, in the next, I guess, 24 to 36 hours to really leave a, a no stone unturned uh, approach to getting everyone to respond. Yeah, I mean, the best thing that, that, that I can think of is, is using the tools, you know, the self-response that where areas, neighborhoods with low self-response, that, that has been the, the areas in which we've had a knock on doors the most. Those are the areas where we have the probably the greatest probability of, of getting proxy data versus data directly from, there, there's just more chances to, to get proxy data. So, so that I would say would be the focus. I, I mean, we have data either directly from a household or uh, uh, via proxy for all but 2,600, what did I say, 2,367 addresses in New York City as of this morning. Um, so it's, it's really, we're wow. hopeful that some of these people who've, who maybe they would never open up their door to us, maybe they're, they're hearing a message, maybe they're gonna see something tonight, maybe they're gonna go buy an MQA event and self-respond because that self-response will supersede that proxy data that we collected from their neighbor on, you know, who lived in that particular household. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Kalos. Uh, we will now call in Council Member Menchaca. Guarding time. Thank you, uh, Jeff. I just also want to say thank you for all the work you're doing and Two quick questions. One, will you commit to coming back to the council in front of the committees, the task force, and work with us to really build a 10-year plan? I feel like we engaged you uh, a year and some ago where we probably could have benefited from working with you and the learning that this pandemic has offered you. Could you could you come and join us for a conversation? I think that's it. 
Yeah, I think that's a fantastic idea. I will commit to doing that. And, and the other thing I'll commit to is we have a wonderful program, a data dissemination program that teaches the public how to use this data that we're collecting when we release it, you know, whether it's for grant writing purposes or emergency management planning or just for, for basic community planning. Uh, it's a free resource. And I think it's a great way to, to, to couple um, the, the conversation you're talking about with also helping your community members and learning how they can use census data for their benefits. Beautiful. Thank you for that. Uh, the, and then the second question is, we, there, are some, there, there were some questions about the workforce itself and how you adapted. Did you receive any issues from staff that were already in motion and before COVID uh, entered into COVID world? And are those things filed? Uh, I, I think I'm anticipating some issues that may have come up that might not have been presented that we can also solve. And, and I'm talking about your staff, uh, the federal staff, and do those get collected and can we, can we learn from that as well? Yeah, and I'm not sure I understand motions as far as uh, issues employees had in, in the work they were conducting or? Yeah, the work, uh, I, I really wanna hear from workers in terms of what happened on the ground, uh, PPE issues, any, any of those kind of things that are gonna be, I think, important for us as we compare both the city effort and the federal effort. Absolutely, I, th I think if it's, as long as it's not anything, you know, uh, tied to Title 13 data or talking about specific experiences on knocking on particular doors in a community, uh, I, I think that information can be shared. And we are, we catalog awesome. every, every concern we receive. Beautiful, beautiful. That, that'll be kind of after, after all of this. And then the final question is, uh, I was, I was on a phone call with some folks in Texas and they are doing really well. They're gonna, they're, they're already counting the number of new Congress people that they're gonna have and the new dollars that are coming in. Uh, are you already seeing and, and will you be able to see this kind of uh, analysis and data about how the execution happened state by state, city, urban center by city, urban center? And is that something we can expect in, in terms of of information and do you have some uh, learning to share right now about other cities that it did it just differently um I, I feel proud of what we've done here in the city of new york but it'd be great to kind of work with you to get colleague information about other cities yeah i think that's definitely something we could pull together I, you know i talked to, earlier about all the partners that that signed up to, to partner with the census bureau for 2020 as well as the commitments and and all the events they hosted we certainly have that available nationwide and we can pull that from the largest cities. And I'll just tell you from my experience, this is my third census. Um, you know, I worked in the Dallas region in, in 2010 and in, in the Detroit region in census 2000. I have never seen a partnership effort um, as I've seen in New York City. I've never seen, you know, and it started back when that, that whole citizenship question debate and there were some very loud voices yeah. and they kept, kept that momentum going all the way through the census. And it's been an honor to work with all of you and all the partners um, you know, throughout New York City. It's, I have never seen the, the effort, the perseverance and, and the, the re-engineering as a result of COVID-19 that I've seen um, from New York City partners. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear testimony from representatives of the public library systems. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. I would now like to invite Jin Hyun Bae to testify, followed by Jay Brandon and then Iman Po Maynard. Jin Hyun Bae, you may begin upon the Sergeant's announcement. Uh, if I may, uh, we already have an order set. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, it will be Jay uh, who will be testifying first, and then myself, and then um, Iman. Would that be all right with the um, with you and uh, everyone else? Sure, that's fine. Please go ahead. Jay. Great. Good, a Good afternoon. Mr. Brandon, I believe you're on mute. Yeah, I was. All right, thank you. 
Uh, good afternoon. I am Jay Brandon, the Civic Engagement and Community Partnerships Manager at the New York Public Library. I'm joined by my colleagues, Amon Power Maynard, Civic Engagement Manager of the Brooklyn Public Library, and Jen Hu Bay, Civic Engagement Manager at the Queens Public Library. I'd like to first start out by thanking the City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, Chair Fernando Cabrera, uh, other members of this committee, and the Census Task Force co-chairs, uh, Council Member Carlina Rivera and Carlos Menchaca. Uh, as well as the City Council for holding this meeting and your tireless support of libraries and the services that we provide to New York City. Additionally, I would like to thank the New York City Census 2020 Director Julie Minnett and the entire uh, Census 2020 team, the Complete Count Fund awardees, and specifically the U.S. Census Bureau's New York Regional Office for their ongoing collaboration. We are grateful to the Council for this opportunity to testify uh, to you about our work and ensure that all New Yorkers were counted in this 2020 Census. For over a century, the libraries have been a committed community partner and vital hub. We have over 217 libraries across our diverse city, and we are a trusted partner uh, in conducting this democratic effort in, here in the United States. <clears throat> As essential providers of information and opportunity for all libraries, Essential providers of essential information and opportunity. Libraries are aptly suited to ensure New Yorkers are counted and, and to disseminate accurate information. As a key citywide partner, the three library system developed a proposal that reinforced our strength as community conveners, provided crucial technology and internet access, as well as offered a trusted and safe place for patrons to be counted. In preparation for our work at, to support the census, the New York Public Library, Brooklyn and Queens Public Library created an extensive plan to connect hard to count communities to vital information and technology resources. 110 of our branches were identified to receive additional census support, technology, collateral and programming. This included staff. We teamed up with the US Census Bureau to host hundreds of census job recruitment sessions in our branches to build early awareness and, and later drive self, uh, self response rates. We prepared hundreds of dedicated devices to allow for quick and easy access to the census websites, averting possible scams and long lines for public computers. To ensure patrons fully participated in the census at our neighborhood branches, the three library systems collaborated on a culturally competent marketing campaign designed to engage New York City's diverse communities and drive self-response rates. Each library system hired a team of multilingual census navigators who began visiting branches, training staff, and reaching out to other CCF awardees and partners preparing to launch census programming. Brooklyn uh, Public Library navigators began visiting every uh, Brooklyn Public Library branch, 59 in total, to deliver comprehensive census and community service training to each uh, team member. In addition to its own comprehensive training, QPL navigators assisted in information sessions for frontline staff, children's librarians, and after-school specialists, as well as establish new and deeper connections with organizations working with undercounted populations. QPL collaborated with City Council member Daniel Drum and Barry Garadnitchik to host recruitment fairs in Elmhurst, Glen Oaks, Belarus, Queensville, and Queens Village libraries. NYPL navigators scheduled census cafes, public, pro public programs offering census information in English and Spanish, and established partnerships with organizations such as the Apollo Theater, the National Black Leadership Commission on, on Health to reinforce the importance of census in familiar community spaces. Along with NYC Census 2020 and other citywide partners, libraries began preparing for citywide opening open house events on April 1st, Census Day. We, we had We Count Family Story Times, cultural events to attract new patrons and interactive programs to welcome all New Yorkers, specifically those most impacted by the digital divide. Census messaging was incorporated into existing channels such as ESOL classes, new American workshops, early literacy story times, and other adult programming sessions. By the week of March 12th, the official launch of the census of the census self-response period, libraries were fully prepared to execute a sophisticated prompt 
comprehensive full-scale in-person campaign to get an accurate count through engaging programming, easily accessible kiosks with technology at branches, fully trained staff and partnerships with local CBOs, and then everything changed. I'd like to pass it to Jen. Thank you very much, Jay. So the COVID-19 pandemic affected our library systems as it did many other organizations, shutting down locations and disrupting our in-person outreach plans. As New Yorkers faced a new reality, we shifted our programming and engagement online. As trusted community voices, we know that when we speak about the census, our patrons take note. So we continued to prioritize sharing news and information we coordinated with NYC Census 2020 on messaging to maximize the impact of social media campaigns and newsletters. Our newsletters reach a combined 2 million subscribers and NYPL's NYPL Connect and Book of the Day newsletters in particular reach 1.2 million. Libraries continue to share PSAs via online programming, including story times, ESOL classes, and older adult programs. Our city, state, and federal representatives also delivered PSAs, and on QPL's Facebook page, their videos have garnered over 17 and a half thousand views. Turning to census-dedicated programming, our navigators were absolutely crucial. BPL's navigators hosted Q&As on BPL's social media accounts, a teen census panel, and a teletown hall, teletown halls in Spanish and Bengali with CUNY Census Call and other local partners. QPL's navigators brought together the US Census Bureau, NYC Census 2020, CUNY Census Call, and 11 local partners for 10 Q&As held in 10 different languages. Navigators also played a critical role in other engagement opportunities. As census experts who speak a variety of languages, they were very well suited for executing direct calls to action. They assisted in citywide phone banking and staffed library census support lines. And last but not least, we continue to train our staff and stakeholders to be effective census advocates. BPL and QPL held census ambassador trainings, inviting volunteers, donor groups, and board members. NYPL's navigators led a census-focused conversation for a virtual staff conference. And now I'd like to pass on to Iman uh, from Brooklyn Public Library. Thank you. Starting time. Census navigators, along with library partners and volunteers, safely expanded census outreach outdoors as our neighbors return to the new normal. Recognizing that one in five New York City residents don't have reliable broadband access and that some may not engage with virtual offerings, the three systems brought census messaging to people's doorsteps. In collaboration with NYC Census, we conducted a direct mail campaign to target low responding neighborhoods across the city. We placed multilingual posters in high priority zip codes and conducted billboard campaigns in high traffic, hard to count neighborhood. Brooklyn Public Library put resources into multilingual outreach across the borough. BPL's collaboration with the YMCA of Greater New York and New York City Census produced two call out the count virtual phone banking sessions in August and September, reaching over 4,700 households. Census navigators also collaborated with the Census Bureau and local partners to begin tabling outside of BPL branches and across Brooklyn, from community boards to churches to affordable housing units in low response neighborhoods. In August, BPL's Bookmobile joined the NYC Census March for Racial Justice Caravan, which traveled from Sunset Park to Prospect Park. In September, the library held two census tailgate events featuring the Bookmobile back to school giveaways, music and food distribution from the Campaign Against Hunger. At the end of the month, BPL hosted Skate for the Census, which provided free roller skate rentals to participants who completed the census. In addition to collaborative direct mailings, posters, and billboards, BPL promoted census messaging on Link NYC screens, waiting rooms across hospitals and doctor's offices, and on self-check kiosks at our grab-and-go branches. 
Additionally, BPL recently donated 58 cases of the We Count 2020 Census Picture Book to partners. Earlier this summer, New York Public Library collaborated with local stakeholders to integrate census messaging in the delivery of services and resources. Collaborations with Uptown Grand Central and East Harlem helped connect census messaging to the Latinx community. And partnerships with assembly members uh, U Line Now and Charles Fall strategically targeted diverse communities with proportionately low self response rates. As NYPL began its first phase of branch openings, it partnered with the Census Bureau to establish outdoor tabling events in a scaffolded approach that utilized its street funds as enumeration hubs. The library partnered with elected officials to publicize and provide PPE and school supplies at mobile questionnaire assistance events, which helped enumerate 200 household, over 200 households. NYPL also co-hosted the virtual program, Community Actions Benefits in the Census, featuring Q&A with Census Bureau Regional Director, Jeff Baylor. The library continued to host virtual programs that kept participants informed on key census updates and prepared I'm weekly excited. census emails for frontline branch staff. Almost done. Queen's Public Library Census team helped support the U.S. Census Bureau and community partners with MQA events across multiple locations, as well as outdoor food distribution sites, health events, transit hubs, and more. The QPL's bookmobile was also deployed at a Richmond Hill event, co-organized by the Queens Borough President's Office and community partners. QPL hosted five census back-to-school events with library friends and co-organized Queens Gets Counted, Queens marquee event for New York City Census Week of Action, the library also deployed street teams who counted 1,100 households in Flushing Corona and Richmond Hill. In October, QPL supported the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, um, Chaya, CDC, Adekar, and the National Black Leadership Conference. The concerted outreach of our three library systems aligned with the steady increase we saw in several hard to count communities over the last two months. Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island, who had the most hard to count populations in the state, saw their self-response rates beat those of 2010. We knew that achieving a 2020 census complete count in New York City was going to be a challenge with the added complications brought by the pandemic. But New York City's libraries took on that challenge. We had to pivot quickly and our partnerships were invaluable as we safely engaged with as many New Yorkers as possible to increase the count. Thank you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the sergeant at arms will set the timer and give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Mita Anand to testify, followed by Wani Chin and then Howard Shi. Mita Anand, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you so very much, Chair Cabrera, co-chairs Menchaca and Rivera and members of the Committee of Governmental Operations and the 2020 Census Task Force. I am Mita Anand, Census 2020 Senior Fellow at the New York Immigration Coalition. The New York Immigration Coalition serves as the convener for New York Counts 2020. And through that, I have been acting as the facilitator for New York Counts 2020. And I'm delivering my remarks in that capacity. Uh, for well over two years, New York Counts 2020 has been working through its partners, many of whom are here with us today, uh, to achieve a fair and accurate census. I want to thank the council for their amazing partnership, as well as our partners, and of course, New York City Census. And I would thank Jeff, but he disappeared. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm not going to emphasize all the work that we have done, but I want to direct people's attention to something that's already been discussed, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about response rates and what accurate and quality response rates look like. The Census Bureau has articulated a goal of having 99% of households enumerated. Today, we heard Jeff Baylor say that New York City is at 99.8%. What we know is that we have rushed to get to that number. That with NERFU, the non-response follow-up, that 
the Census Bureau is twice as likely to miss people in a household that would otherwise be counted if we were using self-response. We also know that using administrative records to count people hurts our most vulnerable communities. It hurts young children, it misses black men, and it misses our immigrant communities. These are communities that don't really have those administrative records available. And we also know that the Census Bureau has been relying on proxies after trying, after trying to reach households after only three times versus six times. So what we're saying is when we hear 99 points, uh, I will just con conclude with this. Uh, when we're talking about that, and we're talking about this short and truncated processing period that has to end by December 31st, uh, we are looking at the possible undoing of all of our hard work. And it's incumbent upon all of us to do everything we can to pressure the Commerce Department, the Census Bureau, the Congress, to make sure that we get our statutory reporting deadlines extended so that all of our hard work does not get put to waste. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to invite Wendy Chin to testify, and then Howard Shi, followed by Katie Lowenberger. Wendy Chin, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Cabrera, co-chairs, and members of the committee. I'm Wendy Chin with the New York Immigration Coalition, convener for New York Counts 2020. For the past two years, NYC and our partners have been working on the Census 2020, and there have been many hurdles, both anticipated and not. And I wanna thank the council for their partnership through this long process. While the NYC, our partners, and NYC Census 2020 have shown amazing efforts to increase self-response, the census has been subject to many headwinds with which we are all familiar. The continued assault by the Trump administration targeting undocumented immigrants, confusion over the end date, the diminishing number of groups on the ground, and the shortage of MQAs. Sorry, Jeff. As we chase towards the finish line, we must continue to do everything we can to further encourage self-response. I know there's only 36 hours, but in the past few hours, NYC had just launched a text bank in Brooklyn and a series of robocalls with Whoopi Goldsberg in the Bronx because communities at risk of being undercounted are not coincidentally the same ones most affected by COVID-19 and chronic underfunding. Let's get that 0.01%. So now I ask, what is left to be done? Three things. One, disseminate. For the next few hours, 36 hours, mention the census at every single event. Leverage every partnership. Two, advocate. We are concerned that the urgent data processing will lead to more distortions that will hurt our communities of color. We need to make sure Congress extends the statutory reporting deadlines for the census. And three, empower. Despite the census enumeration coming to an end, city council still has an opportunity to make sure New Yorkers' voices are heard. This city, home to over 3 million New Yorkers, immigrant New Yorkers, many of whom had held the front lines for us during the peak of the pandemic response, are left out of the electoral process. We urge your support for intro 1867 to empower 900,000 New Yorkers with a vote in local elections, a step towards acknowledging the diverse voices and expanding the representation in our city. We're proud of what NYC has done in the face of the pandemic and an administration hostile to successful census. But what we have learned from the past two years is that when we work together collectively, we can achieve great results, even despite the pandemic and an antagonizing administration. So thank all of you for your attention to this issue and your partnerships. Thank you. I would now like to welcome Howard Shi to testify, followed by Katie Lowenberger and then Lena Cohen. Howard Shi, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. And, um, okay, there we go. Um, thank you, Chair Cabrera, and thank you to Council Members Machaca and Rivera and the City Council at large for your unprecedented support for civic engagement on this particular issue. Um, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, the Decennial Census is the primary source of uh, high quality data on Asian communities and Asian ethnic groups, and it's vital for representation and advocacy for our communities. Um, I want to highlight three, well, actually, first, um, I'm hoping that this is just the start of a conversation about what um, worked really well for the census and, um, and what uh, needs to be, what challenges we had and what needs to be improved so that uh, we can document this so that uh, 10 years from now, we don't, we're not starting from scratch. 
Um, so I do want to highlight three things that uh, kind of came up uh, during this process. I think that the city's unprecedented investment in uh, census outreach has um, enabled a great deal of planning and uh, the creation of an infrastructure that's been put in place to uh, well before the start of the 2020 census in March. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the planning had to go out of the door because of COVID, but I think the city census office, I want to um, give kudos to them to pivoting to um, providing a lot of resources for text and phone banking, a lot of virtual engagement uh, and enable the community partners to make use of that sort of that lost time uh, in March and April and May. Uh, nevertheless, we knew that virtual outreach was never going to take the place of in-person outreach, um, especially uh, among our Asian uh, immigrant communities. And so um, in our testimony, we show the improvements that happened within the Asian community in response rates where Asian, the Asian community lagged behind the city overall self-response rates uh, in May, in the beginning of May. Uh, but once we started doing in-person, um, the Asian outreach rates uh, surpassed that of the citywide rates. Um, that just shows the value of in-language, in-person outreach um, done I'm by sorry. trusted voices in the community. And then finally, I think we hope, I hope that we uh, in the city council continues to invest in this civic engagement infrastructure. Uh, it, uh, it would be a pity to have to rebuild it um, 10 years from now. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to invite Katie Lowenberger to testify, followed by Lena Cohen and then Elizabeth Angelis. Katie Lowenberger, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carlene Buccino, and I'm testifying on behalf of Katie Leonberger, President and CEO at Community Resource Exchange, or CRE. And on behalf of CRE, we want to thank the New York City Council Governmental Operations Committee and the 2020 Census Task Force for holding this important hearing on the 2020 Census in New York City. CRE is a nonprofit that provides consulting services to social sector organizations. We serve more than 500 organizations a year, both here in NYC and across the country. And last year, we worked with, strengthened, and advised hundreds of groups leading the charge on today's critical issues, immigrant rights, racial equity, health, education, housing, hunger, and policy advocacy. These groups provide vital community-based services that are lifelines to New Yorkers. And last year, CRE was extremely grateful for the council's support as we partnered to train and support nonprofits and CBOs to pursue census outreach and education. Thanks to your funding, CRE supported 250 organizations that have in turn reached tens of thousands of New Yorkers with their census outreach. Our sessions enabled people to conduct teach-ins within their neighborhoods, equipped frontline healthcare workers to answer census-related questions, and have trained and helped complete count fund awardees to conduct census education in our new virtual world. Throughout the pandemic, we've supported the nonprofit sector as a whole by convening with organization leaders, providing customized consulting support and offering crisis focused webinars for organizations facing difficult decisions. Nonprofits have continued their unwavering dedication to ensuring that New York City gets a fair and accurate count. After yesterday's announcement, we know we can't wait another minute all of us involved who care about this city need to do everything we can to ensure that as many New Yorkers as possible are counted in the next day and a half. From organizations doing critical outreach work, local government agencies supporting this effort, New York City residents who can help, help get the word out in their neighborhoods and communities, as well as go online and complete their own census information. I'm inspired. You can wrap up. Like. Sorry. Okay, thank you. CRE re remains committed to continuing our partnership with the city and its nonprofit partners to reach as many New Yorkers as possible and secure its fair share of resources and representation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. I would now like to invite Lena Cohen to testify, followed by Elizabeth Angeles and then Julio Rivera. Lena Cohen, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you. Hi there. I'm Lena Cohen. I'm testifying on behalf of United Neighborhood Houses. Thank you so much, Chair Cabrera, and to the City Council for this opportunity to testify on the census. Just for background, 
UNH is a policy and social change organization representing 44 settlement houses across New York City and our network reaches over 765,000 New Yorkers each year, all through the lens of delivering holistic services to families and local communities. With a uh, big thanks to the city council um, and of course the leadership of council member Rivera and council member Menchaca, UNH was identified as, as a citywide census partner, uh, which was incredibly helpful because uh, therefore we were able to support our 19 uh, member settlement houses that were also complete count fund awardees. Um, so we participated in the citywide coordinated effort uh, to make phone calls to collect pledge cards pledge cards and to do so much more to really connect everyone uh, living in New York City with the type of support they need to understand their role in the census, as well as the uh, within the broader context of democracy in New York City. UNH is committed to a complete count because the census is about money, power, and respect, and we want to do everything to ensure that people have voices in our city. Which brings me to my last point, uh, which is really, again, looping back to democracy. Immigrant New Yorkers have not only been historically undercounted in the census, but also disenfranchised from elections, uh, despite having lived here, worked here, uh, paid taxes to New York for years. And so that's why I also wanted to say uh, that UNH urges the city council to pass intro 1867 legislation introduced by a member of this committee, council member Udonis Rodriguez. Uh, this legislation would amend the city charter to permit lawfully present residents uh, to vote in municipal elections. I'm inspired. Um, and I'll close by saying that the current pandemic highlights the critical need for expanded enfranchisement as well as long-term uh, engagement among all of our residents in New York to ensure that uh, people really do have a say in the direction of our city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. I will now welcome Elizabeth Angelis to testify, followed by Julio Rivera. Elizabeth Angelis, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Elizabeth Angelis. I am the senior director of advocacy at the United Way of New York City, and we are so thankful for the council's investment and partnership in the census 2020 efforts. We really believe that investing in organizations that have had the trust of those who have been historically undercounted has been the right focus. And for 80 years, the United Way of New York City has partnered across community, business and government to support low income New Yorkers. A complete and accurate count has been core to our mission, particularly as we think about supporting programs that many low income New Yorkers access. And since the start of the Complete Count Fund, we have served as a network convener. We helped guide the development of the New York City Census 2020 campaign plan, the development of the Complete Count Fund goals, and we facilitated collaboration among community-based partners. We also had five staff members as grant managers providing support for 66 of the 157 awardees where we reviewed weekly reports, helped awardees adjust to the virtual environment and challenges of the pandemic among other responsibilities. Our managed awardees account for over 94,000 completes and more broadly, we've reached over 275,000 New Yorkers through our outreach as both a citywide partner and CCF awardee, we've partnered with Hester Street and Robin Hood to host convenings for organizations to share best practices and recommendations on how to reach communities. We recently launched a micro grants initiative with Robin Hood and Hester Street to call the Census Last Mile grant where we host weekly calls with updates. And so in conclusion, we've all worked together to reduce the gap between the national self-response rate and our cities. And we come to the city council to share these experiences and highlight a few key asks. First, one of our goals as part of this effort was to build greater civic engagement through our outreach. We asked the New York City Council to allocate resources to continue the work of supporting community-based organizations in building civic engagement, particularly in communities Time's that have been... May I finish? 
that thank you that have been historically disconnected across the city and second we ask that the council capture all that we have learned to draw from this for the next census and the new york city council has the power and resources to invest in research and analysis that can help us effectively document what has worked and what we have learned and finally we ask that the council invest in census outreach every decade and begin to plan for the census much earlier than we did this year to ensure that we have a complete and accurate count for New York in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will now call on Julio Rivera to testify. Mr. Rivera, you may begin upon the sergeant's announcement. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairperson Cabrera, Chairperson Rivera, Chairperson Menchaca, and members of the Committee on Governmental Relations and the 2020 Census Task Force. Thank you for extending the opportunity to, to deliver this testimony today. My name is Julio Rivera, Northeast Civic Engagement Campaign Manager for the Naleo, National Association of Latino Elected and Appointed Officials, Naleo Educational Fund. Naleo Educational Fund is the leading nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that facilitates full Latino participation in the American political process from citizenship to public service. In view of the dynamic nature of New York City's population, Securing a complete and accurate count of all residents in 2020 is of paramount importance to the city's future. This task was daunting even before the coronavirus pandemic disrupted daily life and activities. The Leo Educational Fund has consistently found that self-response rates trend lower as a concentration of Latino residents of a tract, city, or county increase. In addition, the share of the city's residents who are young ch children, one of the most likely subgroups to be undercounted in past censuses, is larger than the national average. Due to the pandemic, get out the count mobilization was challenging because it had to shift from an in-person to a digital operation. These methods were not always the most effective in reaching the city's hardest to count population who may not tune into a census town hall or find themselves on a phone bank call list. The extended census timeline also forced stakeholders to conserve resources and continually adjust messaging. The Bureau's frequent changes to its plans, plans frustrated its community partners. Most recently, the Bureau's move to shorten the deadline from the announced date of October 31st and the related legal battles created an environment of uncertainty and confusion as to the final deadline for residents to be counted. Moreover, Naleo Educational Fund is concerned that data collected from large numbers of New York City households during the non-response follow-up operations is likely incomplete and omits some households that should and would have been counted if counting had taken place and under expired. better circumstances. We thank the city for its efforts and foresight in funding an unprecedented outreach effort. The diversity and collaboration between partners was invaluable. But we also urge the city to continue being engaged and vigilant on census policy and the delivery of accurate census data moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, seeing no hands raised, I will now turn it over to Chair Cabrera for closing remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, before I give my closing remarks, I want to give an opportunity to Council Member Rivera and Council Member Menchaca uh, for some final words, and then I'll I'll come back to uh, to close it up. If if it's okay, I just wanted to ask the the panelists that are left um, a quick question. I, I wanted to thank you. I know that some of you continue to provide essential in person services, and maybe it was food distribution. You know, maybe it was just helping those who aren't necessarily digitally savvy. You know just go on with day-to-day -day responsibilities. And I, and I thank you for that. I especially know my community-based organizations here uh, took census outreach very, very seriously. And I, and, I, and I give them so much credit, whether it's Good Old Lower East Side or Cooper Square, or Vision Urbana, and the work that we did specifically in public housing was really important to me. Um, I wanted to ask, as your organization did outreach, what was maybe the most common response regarding the census that you received from individuals? Anyone can chime in, sorry. Uh, maybe since we have a few different um, uh, panelists, if, if you have an answer, feel maybe free to- Maybe Howard or Wenny or, well, Wenny, I know because we were doing text, we were doing textathons. Or who? Uh, 
Oh, I, know, um, I guess I got unmuted. Please, yeah, I know uh, when I was out there, I received a lot of different kinds of responses. Some of them were, I don't receive benefits or I'm not a citizen. I am just trying to figure out how I can always get better at outreach and how we can do this you know, much better in terms of whatever we need to do in, in, in reaching New Yorkers that are historically marginalized and have really been targeted by this federal administration. Um, uh, I will give an example for my staff. Um, basically, it comes down to, um, there's this one individual who just was adamant about not wanting to fill out the census, right? Uh, saying that it was, uh, um, um, I think he was, thought it was a conspiracy, a distrust of government on that kind of thing. But I think uh, having a conversation with that individual and just showing that the, the building, um, um, you know, just over a short period of time, a bond and saying that, um, you know, you do matter and then showing that you, you know, and the giveaways also helped in, in getting people to engage. And once you have that conversation, that person actually turned around and started bringing his friends over. Um, I think part of it was there's, you know, certainly giveaways help, but I think just having a conversation with that individual and showing that there are people from the community that really care about the census and that there is um, a reason why we're out there uh, pushing for it. Um, those conversations go a long way. And I think it just comes down to having an individual conversation and finding the thing that the person cares about and tying it to the census because we can find censuses in all parts of our lives and there's always a way to tie it to it. So I think that's the way we ended up connecting with people. Uh, Jay Brennan from the New York Public Library. I'll add, um, just looking in to answer the question, but also thinking about it holistically, um, as some of the folks have talked about the ongoing sustaining effort, I believe it was Council Member Menchaca that talked about uh, looking to build for 10 years ahead. Uh, the collaboration that the New York Public Library and the library systems in general had with the U.S. Census Bureau, I think, was very fundamental to us being able to offer um, a number of mobile assistant, uh, uh, mobile questionnaire assistant uh, events at our branches um, as we started to go throughout our reopening. I think the collaboration that we took to engaging with uh, elected officials around the city, we worked with a number of uh, council members, a number of assembly members. Um, to host events at our branches that allowed for cross collaborations between the two entities, the library or the elected official, um, to tap into all of our networks to um, be able to disseminate information to community members around these events that were happening to be a draw. Um, and then from there, the Census Bureau um, was able to provide staff members to take their responses. Um, looking at, you know, as those are efforts to get the count, um, recognizing to, to answer specifically the question that the council member asked, um, folks largely, you know, the interactions were of reservation and hesitation, of, and hesitation um, having fear of interacting with government officials. While the census um, doesn't have a law enforcement aspect to it, it is still a, a U.S. government um, exercise. It is still a government. It's still a government exercise that involves passing along information. Um, and so oftentimes when we were engaging with community members, when we did our first initial set of town halls to ask some of those questions, that was some feedback that we got um, is that folks, you know, just have a fear of, you know, what it means to engage with the, you know, with the government in that manner. Um, and I believe having opportunities for the collaboration with elected officials and other community partners um, allowed for us to push past some of those challenges. So at the New York Immigration Coalition, we actually put together a very specific messaging package to deal with the issues we knew uh, regularly came up. So to be you know, directly responsive, uh, it, it was questions like, if I have a visa, why do I have to respond to this? The government already has my information. So I think some of us were already ready for the questions of misinformation, disinformation, fear of government, um, but it, it, it at some points came down to really logistical moments of saying like, no, this is a separate counting operation. So through the education work we did leading up 
to the get out the count moment, we were able to figure out what those questions were. So it was uh, questions like you referred to, like sometimes it's, I'm not a citizen, is it me? Other times it's, well, um, you know, would a child count? Why would you count children? They can't vote. And I think a lot of it is that importing of norms from other parts of our lives and assuming that they apply to the census and finding the language in the ways that Jay and Howard explained and finding the partnerships that they explained, but finding the language to make sure people understand like, no, this is applicable to you. Um, I think what was unfortunate with COVID is that moment to have that longer conversation was diminished. And, and it really is that longer conversation. And we knew that going into it, that it would be the longer conversation that was important. Um, so, so when people say, well, it doesn't apply to me, they might just keep walking down the street because they don't want to then stop and engage in a COVID era about like why it actually would apply to them. Um, I just wanted to add something from um, community resource exchange experience to build on what Howard, Jay, and Mita shared. So building on the work that the New York Immigration Coalition and other partners had done around kind of messaging and key concerns, we built out a couple of scenarios and used that in a lot of our teach-in training. So we were reaching kind of nonprofit staff who would be working directly with community members, talking with them about the census, um, and ensuring that those kind of trusted messengers had key messages, kind of elevator pitches, quick sort of responses in their pocket for those different common concerns that we knew um, different community members might be concerned about, living arrangements, language, religion, social security numbers, citizenship, et cetera. So making sure people had really concise, easily memorable talking points that were readily accessible, whether it was in-person or virtual. So thanks to all of the partners who, who did the groundwork on that. Yeah, to add a little bit on, agree with every everybody's statements thus far, but I think that's where Title 13 and confidentiality come into play and why it's so important. I think one of the main barriers when you're talking about the hardest to count communities is that mistrust and that distrust that that information is going to be used against them, right? Um, when I'm living doubled up, um, when I'm living in untraditional households, um, I may not have all of that information for the other people that live in the same housing unit as I do, or I may uh, fear of giving out that information. Um, so it's it's reassuring folks that their information won't be used against them and that, making sure that that information, that message is also coming from those trusted messengers, right? It's, it's the community groups that the city uh, so wisely funded um, to do this outreach work. And it, it is from elected officials like yourselves, council members. Um, you're, you're all trusted messengers in your own communities. Um, so I think having making sure that that message is coming from that right messenger is also key. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And that, that's all the, the questions I had, Mr. Chair. That's exactly it. We, we needed you and, and you all stepped up tremendously. So, so thank you. Thank you from, from the very beginning, from the court case to uh, wrapping up our early morning efforts. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, uh, Council Member Menchaca, final words? Yes, um, thank you. Uh, incredible gratitude right now for every everyone that spoke and those who weren't able to be here because they're on the ground right now uh, doing the good work. I do hope that we can learn from the incredible investment, the human sweat equity, the capital that you've put in, not just the 40 plus million dollars of funding that came in from the council and the city, but your own wisdom that it does not dissipate, that it does not dissolve and disappear, that it actually helps build the next apparatus for this city. That is, that is what I'm interested in doing right now. I think that's the legacy that we can leave for, for everyone uh, as we get, get closer to the next uh, in 10 years, which will happen, uh, it will come. The question is, will we, will we have built what we need to solve the problems um, that we're seeing and we're confronted with? And uh, I'm looking forward to, to working with all of you on this. And, uh, and my, um, my hermana, uh, Carlina Rivera, our, our co-chair, and then our, ch our chair, Gabriela, as well. Uh, I do see a, future, a moment in the future where we can bring you back into a setting like this. Uh, hopefully, it's in person. Um, but if not, that we still commit to that time. Uh, and I hope you can make that commitment today to come back uh, and, and really work, for, work with us to build what we need. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want to take a moment to thank the task force chairs, Menchaca, Rivera, 
uh, for the incredible work that you did, the investment of time, um, your, your passion, your presentation to all the council members, how you were able to be so engaged with everyone that was involved. I want to thank all the advocates that are present and those who couldn't come to today's hearing, but uh, you were all in the trenches. I salute you. I thank you. What you did made a difference. As a matter of fact, made a difference beyond what we often uh, uh, realize uh, in a very direct way. Uh, you're champions, and uh, but our job is not done, as you stated so eloquently. Uh, we have 36 hours to go, and then we're going to have to push for extension because as it was uh, mentioned, it could go all down the drain. And we don't want all those efforts to be for naught because that will be very discouraging uh, for the next round in 10 years. Uh, so thank you. I want to thank uh, the administration for the investment, Speaker Johnson, uh, for all the resources that were allocated. And I want to thank the staff. You were incredible. I always call them the dream team staff. Uh, thank you for all the work. You guys are marvelous. And with that, we conclude today's hearing.